Welcome back to the Brave Podcast. My name is Angelo. You guys know me as Exploring with Angelo on YouTube and Angebona TV. I usually go and hunt ghosts. I go to abandoned places, all sorts of strange places around the world, etc., etc. Recently, we started a podcast and we have just started actually bringing on new and interesting guests to tell stories and all sorts of cool things. And uh, I am here with my wonderful co-host, Moshi. Hi, I'm Moshi, Mohammed, Mo. Everybody knows me as the guy that knows Angelo that's beside him sometimes on the <laughs> podcast. Uh, I'm Moshi Yo on YouTube and Instagram. And today I'm very excited because we have a guest that we go back a little bit. It's very mm -hmm. exciting. Today we're going to introduce you to Daniel Perillo. Hey guys, what's going on? Not what's so up? Much. Very excited for today. How long have we known each other? It has probably been... Oh, oh man. Nine, uh, yeah, probably 12, 13 years, maybe more. I was 18. Wow. Yeah, I was 18. But you guys so. were like well-experienced, more mature 18-year-olds that I know. Mm. Yeah, well, Mo was older than I was. You're, yeah, what's the age gap? Three, three, four years? years? Three years, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, but for an 18 year old, you were like well advanced. Oh, big no? time. Yeah. 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 Well, Huge. I mean, for me, I kind of had to grow up a little bit quickly. So um, is what it is, I guess, right? But uh, yeah, set you up perfectly for right now. Huh? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> tell us about you. Tell everybody what, uh, what you do, what you're into, hobbies, business. Well, um, you know, I love the, the name of the podcast, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of cool. And that kind of is like a segue because that's how life is, right? It's all about being brave. Mm hmm. And um, I've been in the uh, financial sector for what? It's been like 23 years? Probably, yeah. 20, yeah, yeah. Come, I'm 43. I'm turning 44. Mm -hmm. I started when I was 20. So there you go. Bang. Yeah. 23 years. And I got into the financial industry because pretty much my parents got ripped off from an insurance company. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know anything about financial services. I was like going to school. I never liked math. And then all of a sudden, I'm like now doing math. It's like somebody who hates science and now yeah. becomes a veterinarian. Yeah, you know, right. it just it wasn't up my alley. Mm -hmm. But I think it was more of a calling for me because of the experience that I saw that my mom and my dad got taken advantage of in that sector. So nobody wants to talk about insurance and investments like it's a sexy thing. It's not. No. By no way, shape of the imagination is someone at 16 years old saying, "By golly, when I grow up, I want to do insurance." <laughs> like nobody is like that. But what ends up happening is. You know, you end up going on a path because of a purpose and a passion. And it's sort of like instilled because when you have anger or an emotional change within you, that creates a love for something. Mm -hmm. Just like the way you guys are doing right now, because it's something about it that triggered an emotion to make you want to do these podcasts and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Well, that's the same thing like I did in my career. Like, so here I am, you know, I was a kid, went to high school. I was a really, I was a really great student, mm -hmm. grade nine. You know, I was like on the honor roll, 80s, and then, you know, grade 10, you, you know, you are who you hang out with. Mm -hmm. So you guys believe in that? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I was like hanging out with like certain guys that started to skip school. So my 80s went to 70s and then grade 11, my, you know, my 70s went to 60s. By the time I was in grade 12, I was barely scraping by at 50s. You know, I remember the meeting with my principal and like, I think it was like three other one of my friends and the principal is like, listen, you have two options leave or don't come back and my, my friend has, raises his hand he goes sorry can you repeat those two options <laughs> <laughs> and we're like and we weren't bad kids we yeah. just we just skipped school yeah <clears throat> i remember like i used to go to school probably like monday to wednesday thursday and friday i, took, I had long weekends every week you know mm -hmm. and our attendance record was so bad that we tried to get into different high schools and we applied like to schools that you don't want to go to and they said no to us, you know? Yeah. And so I finally got in, I got into another high school and uh, that high school, Dante Alighieri, because I went to Basel's yeah. and Dante Alighieri got me in because the guidance counselor there was married to my old keyboarding teacher. <laughs> and this keyboarding teacher, I'm not going to mention her name, but she used to rub my shoulders. <laughs> okay. So I'm like, miss, you got to do me a favor. You gotta get. You gotta talk to your husband. I need to get into high school, or my dad's going to kill me. Yeah. And so, she he, she got me in. Talked to her husband. I got in. And again, you are who you hang out with. So I hung out with this one guy, solid dude, and uh, we're still friends to this day, Tony Savelli. And he was smart, popular, did well in school. Well, guess what? I didn't skip school. I did well in school, mm -hmm. and I you know I got eighties. 
and then boom, did really, really well. And you'd say that was just by hanging around with that specific group of people. Yeah, like, yeah, but then, you know, you still have a little bit of trouble yeah. in your first yeah, year yeah. and all that stuff. I used to do, like, some crazy stuff. We used to organize walkouts, and I think one time I parked my car in a certain parking spot, and then the teacher kind of parked right in front of me and <laughs> blocked it. So I was like, I grabbed all these, like, short grade tens and i'm like hey come with me there's like 10 of them and they came with me and i think it was like 12 of us and we lifted the car and we moved it (laughs) and then we covered all leaves over it and i backed out the next morning you know after O canada you know will daniel perillo please come to the office please i got suspended (laughs) anyway stuff stuff like that you know anyway so i ended up getting to university Mm -hmm. and throughout that time frame you know when they say young people they don't work and they just don't they're not motivated Mm -hmm. There are a lot of young, motivated people out there, just like the way you guys started out when you guys were younger. Yeah. And so there are people like us. They're just out there. It's just a different generation of motivation, I think it is mm-hmm. today, versus everybody else. Everyone's trying to make money on a, on a different mentality versus, you know, like shovel it, mm-hmm. working hard mentality. I had like 20 jobs before the age of 20. So yeah, that was like me. I was kind of like that. You too. got a lot of jobs? Yeah. Oh, tons of jobs. That's. I was like Arby's, uh, Sears, Canadian Tire, Subway for like a month um, where my mom used to work. Uh, I I tell people that I've actually been working since I was six years old (laughs) because when my family came to Canada, they all worked for the same jewelry company. And back in the day when it used to actually pay decently, um, they used to take the work home. It was like piecework. So you'd get paid. You'd have to do like 2000 of something and you'd get paid like a dollar uh per piece or 50 cents per piece or whatever that's it was piecework piece work. Yeah, yeah that's what that's literally what we were doing so back when i was six years old um, <laughs> you're doing piece work exactly that yeah age. that's hilarious it, it was like it was like slave labor essentially but i mean um it would be my mom and my grandparents because i we used to live with them ever since i was about three years old and they would be sitting there at the table so i'd go home i'd go home do my homework, obviously, have dinner, and then we'd all be sitting at the table putting earrings on cards and labeling and assembling things, and then they would get, obviously, all the money at the end of the week, and then my mom would give me, like, five bucks or whatever. Oh, my. Right? Oh so, man. But, I mean, I learned how to do things. Yeah, you right? also I learned, how you, to, you, you learned what you didn't like. Exactly. You right? learned what you were good at. Yeah, I knew that uh, whatever these guys were doing, I didn't want to do for the rest mm. of my life, right? So I made some different choices as I got older. But I feel like I was kind of like in the same boat where everybody kind of goes through this weird rough patch in oh their life. Because um, back in like, I was a really good kid throughout elementary school. Like, we're talking on my report card, like math, 95 to 98. Right. And the only reason that the teacher would not give me a hundred was because the only person who was perfect was God. Right. (laughs) So she refused up until like the final project or whatever. But then after that early high school got a little bit rocky. I started hanging out, like, like you said, with the wrong people, um, got suspended. Uh, Also the vice uh, vice principal of my school kind of had it out for me. I don't know why. My mom just kind of assumed it was because I had really long blonde hair. Oh, I and was, was just going to say that. And it was, it was easy your hair to was so point me out from a creek because it was so beautiful. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just, I, she's like, yeah, you're just picking on him because of his hair, right? Because he looks like a like a hippie or whatever, right? Which I guess is kind of true. But mm. yeah, he was a he was a jerk, but it is what it is. Um, yeah, so you said, how, how many jobs did you say you Honestly, had? I probably had almost 20. I worked at you know, whole Renfrew shipping and handling. Mm-hmm. I hate to say this, but I think I remember working in a shipping and handling department and I, and I, we had this shipment. I'm going to throw them under the bus. Is that okay? A little bit. Go for it. It's up and, to you. <laughs> and all of a sudden I see like a shipment coming in from the bay mm-hmm. and we had to take off some tags from the bay and put whole Renfrew tags on them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? That's hilarious. And the price jacks up a thousand percent, you know, on some of these pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I worked at, you know, shipping and handling departments. I worked at Fortino's. Mm-hmm. um for in the fish department it was brutal you know you had to yeah. smash fish's heads you know and that was like my dad used to pick me up and he used to put plastic on the passenger uh, side because i used to stink like fish yeah. and he'd make fun of me all the way home i'd take a shower i'd wake up in the morning i still smell like salmon you know yeah. it was just ridiculous um i remember i got fired for eating an olive one time because i'll clean up the olive bar <laughs> you guys like olives i love, love olives what kind yeah. of olives you like uh for me kalamata calabres i'm not a fan of black olives or green olives it's black really olives weird. got a little bit more salt to it yeah. but kalamata is my oh, favorite that's, like, that's my all-time I remember but, but you like the purple ones I or the green ones the green ones the, the green, green ones yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. 
I like those too. But so they were calling me, you know, because I was cleaning the olive bar. So they said, you know, help me out here. So I popped one. The manager saw me and he's like, looked at me and just put the, wrote something down. I'm like, uh oh. Next day, Mm -hmm. fired. But it was a good olive. So I think it was worth (laughs) it. And then uh, I worked at the garbage man at the CNE. I was picking up. I think the highlight of the day being a garbage man at the CNE was like, you know, you go around the little fair and people would give you like a corn dog. Nice. You know, so that was kind of cool. Perks. Uh, yeah, a little perk like yeah. that. I worked in factories, made wood railings, Home Depot, Continental Shifts, two mm-hmm. weeks, days, afternoons, midnights for like seven bucks an hour. You know, different other shipping handling. Worked at Winners, you know, tagging clothes. Um, you know, washed hair with my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad is a hairdresser and he's been a hairdresser like since like forever. Mm-hmm. I think plus 40 plus years minimum. And his clientele is like a ripe... 78 and above mm-hmm. right so it's a right <laughs> you know like it's the not beat. much work involved because yeah. most of them are probably bald by now no right? actually they're pretty good because <laughs> really? they, they tease it and then they do like the beehive and then they spray oh, like half a God. bottle of hairspray on it yeah. so they kind of hold it that's like my grandmother my grandmother still has like the the dome haircut, yeah the it, nonna haircut exactly right? so so i remember washing hair and tips you know you want to sleep in on a saturday morning my dad was dragging mm-hmm. me 6 30 in the morning to the shop to go wash hair with him and you know could you picture like these you know 70 80 year old women harder you know as i'm like you know washing their hair harder quicker slower fast and i'm like oh vey you know so that was but i got good tips yeah. <laughs> so it was great you know I, I worked at a coffee shop you know uh second cup i was a certified coffee agent so i'm pretty dope i can make like a pretty mean mm-hmm. cappuccino latte and all that stuff i did construction i did private investigation one time Mm-hmm. and they hired me for a job i had to go down to like chinatown and uh and i'm like okay hold on who's gonna be out there he goes well it's gonna be a lot of protesters of this chinese newspaper mm-hmm. so i'm out there and i'll see i see people like this you know a bunch of chinese people out there like you know dot, 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 right and I, I'm, I'm supposed to go outside every 30 minutes report what i see and write it down mm-hmm. i walked outside they started yelling at me i said forget it <laughs> and I called the guy. I said, I quit. I'm leaving. He goes, why? Because are you crazy? These guys know Kung Fu. I'm out of here. Right? I'm out. I'm out. Peace. I'm out. I'm dealing with this. I said, I said, for that, my minimum wage? Are you crazy? Yeah. I'm out. Yeah. So I had, I worked at Consumer's Tire, changing tires. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of odds and ends jobs. Yeah. I never was really passionate about it. And then um, I answered an ad in the newspaper. So at that time, I believe um, when I got into Dante, my last year of high school, then I got graduated and I went to university. So my marks gave me enough because it's kind of weird, right? Because they only really care what you do in your last year. So I got into York University. Literally one month from going into York University, York University calls a strike for the whole year. A strike for the whole year. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, I'm, my dad just paid tuition. You know, uh, I didn't have no money. So I'm like, okay, well, I got to go back to work. So I started doing these part-time jobs again. Because it was very easy. I was like, mom, dad, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to start Monday. So I would go to the newspaper and I'd call 20 people. And then the first person to call me back, I'd work with them. Like, I didn't care what I was doing. I was just a worker. Yeah. You right. know, I was a doer. And so all of a sudden, I answered an ad in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And I saw an ad that said, personal financial analysts will train. Yeah. And I'm hanging out with my friends, Keelan Wilson, you know, with a bunch of boys and back then, it, you know, we used to hang out at coffee shops a lot. So you'd be like, you pull up, there'd be like cars, there'd be like 50 guys, 20 girls. Everyone's just hanging out, you know, just, it was a popular little spot. Plus there's not too much else to where to go. <laughs> yeah, Kill mm-hmm. Wilson. So we're hanging out, looking at the newspaper. My buddy looks at me and goes, Daniel. He goes, you don't even know how to tie your shoes. Yeah. You want to be a financial <laughs> analyst. You don't even know what the hell that means. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know what it means, but it sounds pretty dope. Yeah. So I, I answered it, the ad called in, and they were like, oh, are you a student? I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm a student. He goes, well, we're not really looking for students. We're looking for serious people. I said, you know, you don't know me. So, mm-hmm. like, I'm trying to, like, sell myself at this yeah, point. Yeah. I said, you don't know me. Because I also did club promoting. So I would, like, you know, me and my boys would go around school to school, figure out who are the people who knew the most people. And then we, we threw some badass hall parties back in the day. So I knew how to you know, to get people, which was kind of cool. And our first hall party, we had like 1,200 people at La Park Banquet Hall. Like That's it was, incredible. You know, could you imagine being 15 years old and throwing a party and you, you have 1,200 people show up? That's amazing. It was crazy. And people actually paid to show up. You know, it was really cool. So all of a sudden, I was like, you know what? I just want to meet you. Da, 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 da. I was selling myself. So I went in, you know, and 
you know, I heard things I never heard before. Mm -hmm. I heard things like, because I was I was trained in school, get good grades, get a good education, yeah. get a good job with a company, pension, benefits, the traditional route, mm -hmm. you know. And so for me, that's all I heard. That's all I knew. My immigrant parents worked really hard, but they don't have post-secondary education. They just had hustle. You know, my dad had two businesses. My dad was a hairdresser by day, but he owned a flower shop by night. And he was sick for a few years. And then we were like wondering why he's sick. Guess what? He was allergic to flowers. Mm. Wow. So wow. he had to give up one of those businesses. My mom's a travel agent. So they just hustled, you know, live beneath their means, save their money. It's not like really what the OG culture was all about, right? And so I ended up saying, you know what? Let me just take a shot at it because I heard things like, we don't care where you come from. If you're a good person, you work hard and you do good things. You could be somebody. And I'm mm -hmm. like, wait, hold on. My professor was not telling me that stuff. Yeah. My, my teacher in history wasn't telling me that stuff. In math class, they weren't telling me this stuff. My guidance counselor wasn't even giving me any guidance, <laughs> let alone giving me any inspiration. So I kind of, I think, uh, you know, life is about getting a little bit more emotionally caught yeah. versus being taught something. So I was caught onto the the vibe or the notion that if you work hard, you do the right things, you could be somebody. But unfortunately, many people in this world are working in the passenger seat of life. So let's just say, for example, we're driving a car, you and me, Mo, mm -hmm. and I'm driving and you're in the passenger seat. So all of a sudden, you know, you're like, hey, man, Daniel, make a left. I'm like, no, 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 we're going right. So who directs the car? Literally the driver. The driver. Yep. But if you want to go a certain way, it's up to me to bring you there because I'm in control of the car, mm -hmm. even though your motivation is to go somewhere else. Isn't that what most employees are in this world? Absolutely. They want to be the driver, but they are in the passenger seat of life. And so for me, I was thinking to myself, I don't want to be a passenger of life. I want to be a driver. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so for me, I was like really excited when they said, you could be a driver of life. You could work for yourself. We could teach you how money works. And I'm like, yo, I I, I cheated in math class and I still <laughs> failed. I said, are you sure? They said, no, no, don't worry about this stuff. One plus one is two. We can teach you that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what we can't teach you? We can't teach you hard work, discipline, please and thank you, how to shake somebody's hand, how to look somebody in the eye, how to be respectful. You know, the common sense mm -hmm. of life that sometimes we miss? Yeah. That stuff. Yeah. And so for me, I was like, okay, wait, hold on. You're telling me if I just have to work hard? and do great things, I could be somebody? <laughs> They're like, yeah. I said, where's the catch? Mm. I said, I'm in. So I bought into that. I think I was sold more of the hope. I hope these guys ain't lying to me. Yeah. And I remember signing up to get a license in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. And I called my girlfriend, who's my wife now. I just wanna add that in there. <laughs> and I call her, I'm like, Sandra. I said, I just, I just started something. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought it was a job, but really it was a business, right? I just got a job. And they're like, what are you going to be doing? I said, well, I didn't really know. I didn't go into too much detail. All I know <laughs> is that they just told me that I, I can do it. I can get a license and I can learn about money. She goes, but don't you ask more questions? I'm like, I should have. <laughs> oh, by the way, I had to pay $200 for a license. You had to pay for $200 for a license? <laughs> but it's, a, it's an education. It's yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's like people going to school. You have to pay to go to school, no? Mm-hmm. Well, we're getting a license by the government of Ontario. They're just not going to give it to you for free. Yeah, exactly. Because it's an independent business. It's not an employed structure, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I started, um, you know, started studying. I, I didn't have the easiest route getting licensed. I'm mm -hmm. not going to lie. Because for me, what you got to remember is I kind of coasted through high school. So now I have to buckle down. So I went to go write my first exam and, then, you know, I failed. And I was back then it was like 75% to pass. And my, my mentor was like, no, Daniel, you could just keep, just keep going. And I'm just like naive and gullible, you know? Oh, really? Okay, you believe in me? No problem. Because mm -hmm. I, I never had people that believed in yeah. me. You know, other than my, my dad who said, Daniel, you could sell rice to China. Mm -hmm. Other than that, like, it was just, everyone's like, you just got to go do well in school. And I mm -hmm. thought success was, you got to get a good grade. And so I kept working hard and eventually I failed, I mm -hmm. failed, I failed. And I was still, you know, working part time because I still needed to survive then. And school is off, so I'm trying to do everything all at once. I'm trying to hustle. And eventually, and I'm still doing appointments with my trainer, and I'm seeing what the industry is doing. Other insurance companies, other financial companies selling the wrong products to people. You know, too much insurance for, you know, too much money. 
you know and i was like why why are people being sold this crap yeah when i can give them the proper coverage for the cheapest price possible take the difference invest it over a period of time and they become self-sufficient mm -hmm. and so everything that we're teaching is from the wealthy barber rich dad poor dad abc's making money wealth you know all that stuff you know um and and so i was bought into the idea that okay it works mm -hmm. the math works i see what we do is honest and moral i just got to get this license now because a lot of people have a driver's license unfortunately they don't know how to drive yeah mm -hmm. did you ever find that problem i mean <laughs> do you know what city we're in right now oh, actually, <laughs> i'm not gonna say the, the highest, name but you guys have the highest uh, car insurance ever oh it's it's unbelievable <laughs> yeah. man i pay like 250 bucks a month or something like that it's, i think you're lucky i think you're lucky because it should be a little bit more than that i think yeah. last time i heard my brother-in-law told me because he's got a lot of shops mm -hmm. and some of them in brampton and he says that Brampton has one of the highest car insurance in North America. It has, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. it's the highest car sure. insurance yeah. rate wow. in, yeah. in North That's America. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, to wrap it up on that side is like, okay, I just kept going. You know, when you just don't want to stop and there's nothing going to stop you. Yeah. You know, mentally, I think success is all about your mental decision, and you eliminate everything else, and there's just no way you're going to mm -hmm. go anywhere else but up. Yeah, and you, so you just kind of find a way to to do something regardless yeah. of whatever might be standing in your way kind of thing right and i had the obstacles mm -hmm. i had rejection i had family and friends that told me you know just go get a job or yeah. you failed too many times i eventually passed my exam it took me six months to pass and i passed on my 14th try yeah i didn't have a car back then and i had to go right at bloor and sherborne which is not really the nicest area back in the day you know, it's just a lot of like, you know, homelessness on the street, mm -hmm. you know, see people shooting up while they're walking. Like, it's just crazy, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So my dad used to drop me off, I remember, on his way to work in the morning and uh, to go on the subway. And he's like, are you staying for one exam or two? And I'm like, I, dad, I just scheduled the whole day. I'm here for the whole day, just in case. And, you know, I had to pay $75 each time. I was like, I, I was I was putting money into this. Mm hmm and I was like ripping through that four hour exam in like an hour and a half. It was multiple choice. I was just ripping through it. So I was like, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. Eventually, I'm like, something's got to change. So I said, you know, I'm going to switch this stuff up. Yeah. D, C, B, yeah. A, D. <laughs> and eventually I passed because of that. <laughs> now, I tell my people, because I have a fairly big organization today, yeah. which I'll get to, but I don't tell my people to, to study like that. But mm -hmm. I tell the truth. That's how I passed. But now I know it because now my understanding and passion and love is into it. I think I was just at the higher source of saying, hey, man, we got to give this guy a license because he's got to do something great. And mm -hmm. I remember the day I passed my exam, I passed that exam and I jumped up out of my chair. I was so excited. And I went downstairs and the first person I saw was a homeless guy just sitting there with a cup. I'm like, dude, it's your lucky day. <laughs> and so I went in my pockets and I gave him all my money that yeah. I had. I walked down to the subway and I was about to pay and I'm like, I just gave that homeless guy all my money. <laughs> so I had to walk back to the homeless guy. I'm like, listen, man, you're never going to believe this, but I need two bucks to get home. <laughs> and he gave me two bucks and I got home. And that's how I started. And that's how I got licensed in the financial industry. And then from there, you know, I ended up uh, going really hard. And then six months later, I became a uh, broker mm -hmm. and I got the best contract in the financial industry. And I was really excited about that, but I worked really hard for it. I worked really hard. And a lot of people don't understand is that sometimes people like, you know, they put in that eight hour shift. Yep. No, no, no. I was working seven days a week. I was working mornings, like sometimes Sunday morning at a nine o'clock in the morning, I was calling people mm -hmm. like it was just odd hours, yeah. you know, working till 10, 11 o'clock at night, sometimes throughout the week there, I was missing a lot of the birthdays, the family get togethers, mm -hmm. you know, instead of some people being there for six hours, I was there for like 30 minutes and then gone, mm -hmm. right. you know, I had to pay the price and people don't know in life. If you, you're either going to live the dream today or you're going to pay the price later mm -hmm. or you pay the price today, then you can live the dream later. Now, just because you're paying the price doesn't mean it has to be distasteful because it, right now you guys are putting in the time you're mm -hmm. doing these extras right now, but you love it. Mm -hmm. So when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Yeah. You follow? Mm -hmm. And so when I got that license, I was like, let's go. Six months, become a broker. Five months after that, at the age of 21, that's my 11th month license, I ended up um, opening up my first office at 21 years old. And I remember it because I had to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. It was 2000. This is going back 22 years ago. $2,354 a month rent. And I remember the landlord in the winter, he put it up colder. In the summer, he put it, put it warmer mm -hmm. just to save money, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember there would be like $1,000 in my account, you know, five days later, 
you know, the rent is about to come out and everybody would go home at a regular time and I'm there just hammering the phone, mm -hmm. just waiting for that next deal to, you know, to break. And once I got into that groove, I started making it and I made my first six figures uh, before the age of 23, mm -hmm. you know, made a quarter million by the time I was 25 and, uh, you know, uh, became a multimillionaire and saved money and did my thing and, you know, just just sort of knocking on the door of a million a year yeah. uh, annually on a residual basis. And, you know, we start by ourselves, but, you know, I had a big dream. And then I ended up, you know, a couple of years later, I bought a, a building where I run my business from. And then from there, we open up another seven locations. So right now we have eight locations, uh, 16 other brokers, and we have 315 uh, part-time and full-time people who work in our business. Wow. And we manage a lot of money, um, you know, close to $300 million dollars. And we're helping a lot of people in all different areas mm -hmm. of personal finance. And that's kind of, my wife is fully licensed in the business. You guys know my brother-in-law, yep. you know, he's a super dude, Franco. Mm -hmm. um, so we have family, friends, and it's uh, it's a blessing. And I wake up every single day grateful for what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yep. Yeah. Truly uh, very impressive. All um, this from a guy who got kicked out of high school. Not bad, right? <laughs> yeah. Fire freedom and all of yeah, I was yeah. just about to say that. <laughs> Fire freedom and all of it. Yeah. I, I, I kind of remember that too when um, when I first got involved in the business a long time ago. Um, learning about the idea that people out there are actually getting ripped off. Mm. And uh, I'm like, this this can't actually be happening. There's got to be something. You're looking for the gotcha. Right? That's right. Like this, nah, nah. This guy's full of shit. Up until my mom's agent came to the house he was actually a family member he's passed on since and um i remember he was sitting there having coffee visiting my grandmother or whatever and um i think i was upstairs or something and i could hear his voice and i'm like that guy's here <laughs> so i went into the kitchen and i like kind of like you know started talking to him and then all of a sudden he started getting very aggressive as i started confronting him about what he did to me and my mom essentially over you know the finances by the end of it um let's just say while he was putting his shoes on getting ready to run out the door he basically looked at me and i said i didn't do it for you i did it for me in terms of you know trying to get the commissions mm -hmm. and whatever so he basically screwed me and my mom i can't believe he said and that. yeah he literally said that to my face that was a family member yeah. so ever since you know learning that getting that uh that out of him for him to be so honest about it um i knew obviously there was something going on yeah i think there's a lot of people out there that are in this industry specifically mm -hmm. the financial industry there's so oh, much money to be made right mm -hmm. and i think that um a big motivation for it is money mm -hmm. unfortunately and i always say there's two reasons why people sell these policies that nobody believes in as a consumer basis mm -hmm. there's no book that's talking about it, no advocates about it but yet the agents are the only ones that are pushing it. And from these insurance companies yeah. is either a, you know, that's the way they're trained by the company because mm -hmm. it's a, you know, cash cow brings in a lot more premium, very profitable for the insurance company itself or B they know how it works and they just don't care. Yeah. Because, you know, if you sell a policy and you're getting paid a $2,000 commission up front, plus, I don't know, five, $10 a month residual forever mm -hmm. versus selling a different type of policy where you're giving the person more paying less, but upfront commission is only $500 yeah. and then you never get paid ever again. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to sell? If you're a salesperson, you're going to try to convince yourself. You're going to try to rationalize and you're going to try to make up something in your mind to actually make that other product that's more expensive sound somewhat good. Yeah. But yet every time I come across it, do you have any policies I've replaced? How many? I've replaced probably in the terms of, uh, 350 to 400 policies i have over a thousand clients mm -hmm. and i've had agent confrontations and i would record them i would say okay everything that we're talking about i'm going to document it so if you say anything that is against it you know we're going to submit it to the government and they would stand up and just mm -hmm. walk out mm -hmm. is that still a um a common thing that no. you actually said like agent confrontations or most of the time no it's not as common anymore because no. everything is online right yeah so COVID made our business, unfortunately, you know, for some other people that, you know, didn't do well, which I totally feel mm -hmm. bad for, um, made our business 10 times better. Yeah. Because instead of me driving to Milton, to Toronto, to here, to there, mm -hmm. I could just jump on a Zoom meeting. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I think that uh, makes our business easier, more accessible and all that stuff, which is great. So we have more people joining my business part time where mm -hmm. they have jobs, but yet they could do something on the side, like a mom that has their kids she's trying to make dinner yeah 
And then all of a sudden does the dinner, goes down to the basement, does a Zoom for like 30 minutes, comes back, reads a little story to the other kid, goes back, does another. And you could work part time. Yeah. Where, you, where else could you do that unless you're, you know, I don't know, you have your own little business. This yeah. is where it's at. That's why we're attracting a lot of good people in our industry. And that's why we're always looking for good people. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to find good people. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, right now, the way things kind of are with everything, you know, costing so much more with inflation and people can't afford rent. Well you have single moms who are literally skipping meals just to be able to feed their children, which is very unfortunate. Um, now is now more than ever an opportunity like that is obviously very important, right? I remember 20, 20 plus years ago, if I spoke to, let's say, I don't know, 10 people who are making a six figure salary maybe two would entertain the notion of mm, I'll, oh yeah maybe i'll look at a different side mm -hmm. gig make extra residual income on the side today a hundred thousand is not a big deal no a hundred thousand is is almost nothing these days right Crazy. i mean Minus taxes and i all know that stuff. i know a lot of people where both husband and wife make six six figure incomes and even that is not enough no. anymore Right. I mean, with mortgage and interest rates through the frickin roof, most people, um, especially recently buying homes, let's say one point five million dollars, all of a sudden the interest rates went up and your mortgage alone is what, six thousand, seven thousand dollars a month. Right. That's almost one of the members incomes, not to mention, you know, the rest of the you know property tax and groceries and all that stuff. So people need to make more money these days. At the end of the day, banks knew what they were doing. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. when interest rates were at the absolute lowest, mm -hmm. what kind of rate were they pushing? Only variable. Yeah. So they knew what the future was going to come. Mm -hmm. And as things grow, what happens to the profitability for the bank? It grows. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, as variables being pushed down over the next year or two, which it will slowly come down, mm -hmm. what do you think they're pushing now if you go to get a mortgage at the bank? Fixed. Yeah. Because they want to lock in that higher rate because mm -hmm. as things go down, they don't want to lose money. Mm -hmm. So the banks know what they're doing. And I think that's, that's where companies like us, we always say we bring sort of like, you know, Bay Street or Wall Street to Main Street mentality, mm -hmm. you know, um, the type of advice that we give. Um, we're giving that person who has a, I don't know, let's say the average person goes to the bank and has $10,000 to invest. Who are you sitting down with? You're sitting down with a personal banker who maybe went to school for biology, yeah. can't get a job, and now they're working at a bank. Mm -hmm. You know, Not to say that they don't like it or anything, yeah. but it's just you're not getting that feature. And they have a quota-based system and putting people in the GICs, line of credits, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting that personal satisfaction. You can't get a hold of them on a Sunday. You don't have their cell phone number. Unless they're a relative or something, you're not getting that service. Right. Whereas if you want to get referred to a high-end financial advisor, you got to have 250000 or $500,000 until you get proper financial guidance. Mm -hmm. We can give that sort of top-notch uh, service for as low as $25 a month. Yeah. So we are serving the middle class, the, ser the middle class being lost. Mm -hmm. There's companies out there that have been leaving the middle class. Like mm -hmm. I know that you know companies like Investors Group who just left them. You know, they left the average person. If you don't have a minimum of 250000 they just gave you up. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. So it's like, we can't give you advice. Now, that's their philosophy. Mm -hmm. But our philosophy is, as long as you are willing to start investing, hey, we're willing to help. Yeah. I think that's kind of cool. I really love that notion of how we help people, mm -hmm. which is good. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really good. Um, so... After how long did you say you were in the comp in the business for? So 2000, May 2001, yeah. I got licensed. So 2001, we're in 22, 22 years. 22 years. Yeah. So after 22 years of busting your butt, um, nonstop grinding, you're probably one of the hardest working people I know personally. Appreciate um, that. Maybe apart from myself, but um, <laughs> I just don't travel as much as you. No, <laughs> you must have some serious air miles. Oh my god, air miles? No, no. You don't have an air miles kilometers, car? Kilometers, I do, kilometers but yeah, I car. drive. I drive everywhere for the most part. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so you have a good gas card. You better have sure, a good gas card point system. I mean, I, I use Wealth Simple cash card, so I get one percent cash. Back. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that's so good. It's. I mean, why just use your own bank card when you can uh, get some cash back? Exactly, right? It go. just makes sense at the end of the at end of the day. Um, but after all these years. Years, um, would you say that you're working just as hard now as you were in the beginning, or have you kind of slowed down? You're kind of taking a little more time for yourself, and like, what would you say that? You're yeah, doing? I, I definitely work very differently today than how I started. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, in the beginning, it's more like spray and pray. Yeah. Anybody want to have a conversation with me? Yeah. You want to talk to me? I'll yeah, talk to you. Exactly. You know? yeah. <laughs> but as experience grows, you understand mm -hmm. some people just are, you know, not worth your time. Yeah. 
I was because just you got to remember, I'm not going to invest my time. I'm not going to spend my time to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm giving my time and effort into in somebody that they got to show me a little bit of effort. Mm -hmm. And if they don't give me that effort, how much time and effort can I give back? Yeah. Show me love, I give you love. You know, yeah. that's the way it is. So I think I'm working more effective today than ever before for a few reasons. Number one, I figured out my groove mm -hmm. because I've mastered uh, understanding people. So sometimes, you, you know, you, when you put too much love into a relationship where they're not giving back to you, and that's even like for friendships today, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, that's like relationships and business. And so I would give a lot of time and effort, and all of a sudden they wouldn't give me anything back. Then I'm thinking to myself, why did I give all this person so much time? Right. But you need to figure that out. That's like figuring out personalities. So in our business, experience is your greatest teacher in the world. You learn by doing. You don't yeah. learn by reading a book. Yeah. You learn by doing. So in, in our business, you could read all the books in the world, and I read a ton of books. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start dealing with people, you realize, okay, I'm going to invest my time with these types of people, and I'm going to use generic time with these types of people. And then you realize that your your effective working life and you know how to balance family and everything, and so, mm -hmm. which is really cool. So I'd be like, I, I'll go to everything. I go to all my kids' sports. I do all that stuff, which is great. And I'm like one of the few dads that at every school event during the day that I was there. Mm -hmm. And that makes me happy because my kids grow up recognizing that. Yeah, I know people are killing it. You know, making a hundred, two hundred thousand corporate executive. Mm -hmm. They're not at the sporting events. They're not at the daily events. And so it's kind of cool that I was able to figure out a work-life balance. Yeah. Plus, it also helps when you have a little bit of a, a kicker, a little bit of a good, decent income that's coming in. Yeah, exactly. Where you don't have to push as hard and, you know, build it up. Eventually, you, you support. You'd think that you'd raise a kid and that kid eventually takes care of you. Yeah. A successful business, you would raise it and you still have a finger on the pulse and you still know what's going on. And I still work hard because I love it. Not because I have to, because I love it. And people come into the business with which their responsibility is they want to become successful. So now it's my credibility in the line that's looking them in the eye saying, listen, I'm going to give you some mm -hmm. time and effort for me because if you're showing me the love, then I'm like, I want to get into the gauntlet with you, man. I want to go run the race with you. I'm not the guy that's on the horse that says, charge. I'm the guy that loves running the race with people. But when you're building it with people that you love, it's a different type of work because you get to choose when you want to, how you want to, with whom you want to. And, it, it, you know, that to me is really the exciting thing. So, yeah, yeah, sure, of course, it's a little bit different, right, today, but it's much mm -hmm. more fun. Yeah, definitely. I feel like um, our stories are almost kind of similar in a way. Um, so I remember when I was in high school, like you said, you're always being told to, you know, get good grades, go to university, whatever, get that good job, whatever that might be, or whatever that might mean. And uh, I knew by the end of high school, and I was already getting like good grades. I had that one kind of like, you know, speed bump back in early high school where, you know, I was around the wrong people, but then I kind of smartened up my act and started getting my shit together. And uh, I was already obviously involved in the, the financial industry and whatever. And I kind of knew at that point, I'm like, I do not want to go to university. There's nothing that I would rather do than be an entrepreneur, start my own business and work for myself and not have to answer to anybody else. And uh, I still remember that day when um, uh, that I told my mom that I was not going to go to university. Oh, God, she was so angry with me because um, I got accepted to York University. I made a couple of applications to different places. and I, I didn't know you got accepted to uh, York University. Yeah, I was. I don't even remember what I applied for, but they <laughs> sent me some offer to go for economics or something. And I'm just like, I remember the day I got accepted, like the letter actually came in the mail. And my mom was like, oh, my God. <laughs> now, I could hear her from downstairs, right? And uh, I'm like, oh, shit. I already kind of knew at that point that I didn't want to go anymore. And uh, so I didn't tell her right away. But then the following day or two, whatever, uh, we were driving somewhere. It was probably the worst time that I could have possibly told her because, you know, she was angry operating, <laughs> you know, a car. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I just don't want to go. She's like, what do you mean you don't want to go? You have to go, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I just don't want to go. Um, and then after that, I did so many different things. I was involved with you at one point for a long period of time mm -hmm. uh then mo and i had got involved in our sporting goods business um what else did i do i did computer well that was yeah. i was still in high school jerseys jerseys yeah um and then you were the best jersey guy i was the best jersey guy yeah <laughs> i'm everybody. telling you i'm really disappointed that i don't have a jersey guy like you anymore i'm really really sad <laughs> i'm just too busy man i don't i don't got the time for you know it. what you need to duplicate yourself yeah. because we need a new jersey guy i know right <laughs> we're gonna it's talk a good. little bit about that in the future right? <laughs> we're talking about that today right oh my god about the jerseys and soccer and all that well, stuff yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, it was, it's funny because I actually just had somebody who texted me like maybe 10 minutes before you got here. Hey, Angelo, you still sell jerseys? I'm like, oh, nope. come on. Yeah, for That's real. Hilarious. So if it were me, like, I mean, 
I, I could easily make an extra couple of bucks. But it's fun. Like, it's, it's for fun. Yeah, yeah I don't. I don't. Fun. I don't need to yeah, yeah. to do that, and I just don't have the time. It's no, just, you're busy. It's just too much. But um, speaking of all of that, so back in 2012, um, Daniel and I made the amazing decision <laughs> to purchase tickets to go and watch. So we were massive soccer fanatics. A lot of people probably online don't know that about me. Um, but this is well before I started YouTube or anything like that. Otherwise, I would have probably recorded the experience. But uh, Daniel and I were soccer nut jobs. Like we were just absolutely insane about soccer. Yeah. And uh, we were like, dude, how cool would it be? There was the Euro Cup coming up in 2012. We were like, how cool would it be to actually buy tickets and go to some of the games, some of the Italy games, whoever they end up facing? We lucked out because um, I said, you know what? I'll keep an eye out for tickets. So we lucked out and um, UEFA had a reseller program. The tickets had already been divvied up. And the way it works is kind of like a pool system and it's just totally random. Right? Mm. I think it's, what is it? You select like the certain areas. You got to follow, you follow your team, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't really remember off the top of my head, but I just remember going into the reseller por portal and uh, the first ones was Italy versus Croatia. And uh, I remember I messaged you. I'm like, yo, I can get these tickets. You want me to buy them? He's like, yeah, do it. So I got those. And then I think within two hours or something like that, the Italy versus Ireland tickets came up in the same reseller program. Whoa. And then I'm like, dude, these tickets are available too. And the crazy part is it's literally in the same city four days after the first game, if you remember all that. Yeah. And uh, we got both of the tickets and we're like, we're both nuts, but let's go and do this. We're going to another country just to watch some soccer games. And, uh, uh, we had a blast, man. There was. Uh, do you remember all that? Everything that happened on that trip? I, I think that was my biggest. That was my first biggest. Yeah. You know, cup yeah. trip, and um, you know, I remember Sandra saying because my, you and Angelo didn't even really know each other yeah. that well, yeah, yeah. and you guys are now gonna go sleep in a bed together. I like. Listen, <laughs> we we have separate beds, <laughs> right, okay? Right. Exactly. But if it's absolutely necessary for the love of soccer, we got to do. it. I mean, whatever, man. If one of us had to sleep on the floor, who cares? Yeah, at exactly. That point, right. So, so we're going to. Poland, mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, I don't even know what currency they have there. Zlotys, Zlotys, right? <laughs> they got their own thing, and and you know, everybody dreads the you know the trip over. It's a long trip, you know. It's like you're you're sleeping half, you know, you know, up and all that stuff. By the time you get there, man, it was just a beautiful. Mm -hmm. We stayed at you know where we stayed. I remember Poznan. Poznan, yeah, that was the name Poznan. of the city. Um, we stayed at this dinky little family-run hotel. That's right. And uh, th so it was funny because the first game was the same day that we arrived. So not only did we just get off of a nine hour flight. We had to get ready. We had to get ready. And uh, so, so the funniest part that I remember the first day of the hotel, do you remember that couple that we met outside yeah. the hotel? Yeah. So I remember getting there and there's this couple and they're speaking Italian. I'm standing outside. This is like way before we were even ready to go to the game. So they're speaking Italian. So I start talking back to them because I could speak pretty decent you're pretty good at yeah, italian i'm okay i gotten a lot better now yeah yeah i'm actually i'm practicing. actually studying italian and all that stuff which yeah. is good how, how are you learning like what are you what are you doing to you learn? know what i'm doing um this girl i'm not doing the girl <laughs> <laughs> let me take that back Oops. sandra yeah <laughs> um, on luciana or something like that on uh youtube or something like that oh, she's okay. Okay. she's wicked you know and oh, cool. I, I i listen to about 30 30 minutes a day mm -hmm. that's you know, good so stuff so yeah you're probably italian or molto bene no so yeah. it's good. Yeah, we're getting better, much better. Buono, buono. So. Yeah, you I've plan been... on using that somewhere? You plan on traveling to Italy more? Oh, or... yeah. I'm actually going to Italy um, July 5th. Oh, nice. Going nice. for It'll two weeks fun. with my family, yeah. my sister, her kids, my nice. dad. That's we're awesome. going to go to uh, the South Calabria. That's where he's from. He wants to take us around. This is where, mm -hmm. this is where we grew up. This is where I walked for yeah. 20 miles, yeah. you know? <laughs> Yeah, but so I mean, okay, uh, over there in South Calabria, when they say that, they probably meant it. Probably like meant it. Like, it was, it was a hard, hard life. I remember the stories of, like, when my yeah. family, they were all basically olive pickers. That's why they came. Like, legit, that's what they did. They they lived wow. on a farm, and they worked for the farm in exchange for basically room and board. They didn't have a lot. Um, they picked vegetables for the farm, took care of the animals, whatever. Once in a while, they would end up with a little bit of extra stuff, and they would kind of sell it on the side, just, you know, have a couple bucks extra, right? Like, um, it's a common thing to have meat sauce in Italian. To them, it was a delicatessen. Like, they they would have it maybe, like, once every month, two That's months crazy. or whatever, right? That's Whereas crazy. over here, it's, like, such a common, normal thing to have stuff like that. They didn't have that at I don't, all. I don't even remember what we ate in Poland, because when we got there, all I saw was a lot of churches. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know. 
So in Poland, um, I mean, we had a lot of uh, pierogies. Pierogies. Pierogies was a very big thing. That's right. Um, there was That's one right. day in particular, I think we might have been in Krakow, and we had some dish, and it was all the traditional foods yes. of Poland. Actually, I remember that. We were sitting around in the square, yeah. Krakow yeah. Square. Yeah, exactly. It's I think beautiful. it's uh, Starry Square, I think it's called. Wow. Um, and I just remember... Everything on the plate was good except for we had the blood sausage, I think oh, it was. And horrible. we both, we both, <laughs> oh. I just remember we both put oh. it in our mouths. We're chewing it. We're like, oh. looked around, make sure nobody was watching. We yeah. Like, and they, they like that stuff there. Oh, dude, they they love, they go crazy for no, stuff like that's that. That's not happening. I'm not going to do um, that. But yeah, so the, the funny thing about that couple outside of that hotel. So we had agreed that um, <laughs> we might as well just all take a taxi to the game together because we're all going to the same game, Italy versus Croatia that day. And uh, so we're like, okay, we'll be back out here at whatever time. And do you remember we come back out and we're in like our Italy jerseys because that's obviously our background. That's the team we're supporting. And they changed their jerseys. Yeah, they didn't change the jerseys. They wore Croatia jerseys. Yeah, that's why? what they prepared to come. So I asked them, I'm like, what, what's going on here? Like, why are you supporting Croatia? So they explained it that, yes, we speak Italian. Technically, we are Italian. But at some point in history, the border changed and they're literally right on the border. So when the border changed, their Italian town became a Croatian town. So that's why they were supporting Croatia. And then when we were wow. approaching or when we got into the stadium or whatever, they were like, damn, if I knew had so few Italian fans had were going to show up, we would have maybe worn Italian stuff, right? <laughs> but um, That was incredible. I remember yeah. uh, just going down in the taxis because mm -hmm. a lot of people, they were like super nice. Oh, yeah. Totally. Like just the people himself, just it, 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 you, you, when you go to a foreign country, you don't know what to expect, right? Yeah. But when you meet people who are nice, it makes you love the country even more. Absolutely, yeah. And so I like doing like the tourism. I, Angelo was like a tour guide. <laughs> I was like, Angelo, we got to do this, we got to do that. He goes, I got you. He goes, I'm going to do my research. I figured it out, all that mm -hmm. stuff. And then you're like doing the research. Okay, we're going to go here, we're going to go there. And we did a few things. Yeah, yeah. And then that did, first uh, game that we went to was against Croatia. Yep. Yeah. That yeah. was a killer game. That man. was a really that good was game. game. I remember where we were standing in the stadium. It was actually kind of scary because the Croatian fans are, are very aggressive, very. we'll say. Very loud. Um, just Croatian people are just kind of, it's an Eastern European kind of thing, right? They're very, like, just loud and very over the top, very zealous type of people. And uh, I just remember Italy scored the first goal. And where we were standing in the stadium... It was literally just us two in Italy stuff. Do you remember that? And then Pirlo scored the free kick. It was an amazing goal. Oh, yeah. And just me and Daniel both got up, and Daniel's, like, super loud. And I'm just like, yeah, we're all just, like, cheering. And then we're looking around. Everybody's just kind of, like, staring up at us or, like, down at us. And they're all, like, giving us, like, the, the death stare or whatever because Italy just scored the first goal. And Croatia's down now. And uh, I'm like, oh, okay. And we both just kind of sat down. Um then, One thing I remember. Yeah, go um, ahead. Do you remember the beer in the stadium? Oh my god! Yeah, it was beer. Carlsberg, I think. I, I think I got the um, the cups. I took back. I, I had the cups. Them? Do you? I did. Oh, that's so funny. I, I took some cups home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're green. I think so. Yeah, but yeah. I just remember in the stadium we were looking around. We're like, why is everybody leaving like full cups of beer everywhere? Yeah. Then we went to go and because we were going to go and buy some, and then we're looking at the sign and we're like reading little, little tiny print says uh, alcohol free or whatever. We're like, oh, okay. So everybody's buying all this beer. They don't realize there's no alcohol in it and they're just leaving it everywhere. Um, but yeah, the rest of the beer in Poland is uh, really good. Shout Crazy. Out to, uh, and, yeah. Shout out to you, man. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. That was kind of cool that you brought this. <laughs> I had to. I was actually looking for the one that we tried in uh, Berlin, which was called Skoflenhofer. And uh, the beer store here in Ontario, for those of uh, my American followers, um, we have, when we buy beer here in Ontario, it's run by the government, unfortunately. Um, and it's called the beer store. <laughs> you and, think they come uh, up with a better name than that, right? Right. <laughs> um, they used to carry that specific beer. I remember I bought it once for us and I have not found it since then, but... Is what it is. No, I that, guess. we had some good beer, and I think oh, the yeah. next game that we did, do we go on? Uh, we had a four a couple of days in between. Yeah. yeah so, so we. we did, what did uh, we do? Auschwitz. I think the first thing we did was go to Berlin because where we were in Poznan, it was about 
um, three and a half hours, but with the Autobahn, it's Oof. like two hours because the Autobahn has no speed limits whatsoever. And I still remember, I think I, I think this video is still up on my Facebook somewhere to this day. And it's a video of you going... Flying. It, right. We were literally doing <laughs> right. 178 kilometers per hour, which oh. in miles is approximately, I don't know, like 110 be. roughly. And the only reason we were going so slow was because the car was governed because it was a piece of shit Hyundai <laughs> i20. I remember the model of the car. It was this little tiny compact car that the rental company gave us for like $30 a day with the GPS included, which we could never figure out how to use properly. That's right. And um, yeah, we were literally driving and there was cars just passing us like we were standing still. I think like there was like a minivan with like uh, kids in the back and the yeah. child seat. Yeah. They're just flying through and they're just, yeah. they're just going back and... You know, and we're like trying to figure out how to how to get into the next gear, <laughs> and they're just flying. You yeah, know? it was crazy. Yeah, it was unbelievable. So yeah, we got to Berlin. But and, what a difference uh, when you cross into Berlin, eh? Oh, completely like wow, complete difference. Like I mean, how different? Um, What's, what, what was different? Up, upgrade. It's like an upgrade. Yeah. It's, no, okay. Berlin is just like beautiful. Like it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's aesthetically modern, mm -hmm. and you could also tell based on the people how they're dressing. Yeah. Very, very modernistic mm. fashion. You can tell people are dressed well. Very different in Poland, mm -hmm. I guess, you know. And um, I think it's more Poland is very low-key, but Germany mm -hmm. was just like upscale. It was just so, so, yeah, so yeah. sick. Well, well, Poland, you have to remember, was on the east side of the wall, right? So they were communist up until the 90s. Yeah. So they struggled a lot up until finally the, uh, the Soviet Union fell, the wall fell, and then uh, Poland finally gained its independence from the Soviet Union, which made things significantly better. And obviously it's a lot better than it used to be, but obviously there's still some uh, improvements to be made. But yeah, sure. Berlin, I remember. Um, so I think the first thing we were looking for for is we were looking for a car rental place because I think you had the idea you're like bro we are at the Autobahn we have to rent a Ferrari <laughs> and I just remember Daniel and I driving all over downtown Berlin not knowing where the hell we're going we punched into the GPS at least we tried to anyways and for the life of us we could just not figure out where this place was it would just kept would take us up the road then down the road and then at one point i remember we asked a uh there was a lady who was giving out parking tickets because they used they would park in the middle of the road kind of like on the median or whatever so we we're asking her like do you know where this address is and she's looking at it and she's like i have no idea and i'm like if this girl doesn't know then, then forget it yeah this this is just a a lost cause I, i'm think maybe it was a good sign that we didn't have the ferrari maybe Maybe, Maybe that was a sign from God <laughs> saying, do not go 250 <laughs> miles per hour. We want you to live. <laughs> you know? But yeah, it was it was crazy. That was a long man. trip. That was a great one, though. Yeah, when so... can you say, like, yeah, what'd you do today? Well, we went to uh, Berlin, <laughs> and then we came back to Poland. Yeah, exactly. All, all in, in a matter one day. of, like, one day, yeah. So I remember we got downtown Berlin, uh, looking around for a little bit. We went to some random mall thing, mm -hmm. or some random store. Um, that's kind of like a Macy's, I would describe mm -hmm. it. It's like mm -hmm. a huge department store with like 11, 12 floors. And we're just walking around. And I think I remember you bought purple socks or something or purple <laughs> shoes. And I was like making fun of you. I'm like, who buys purple socks or purple <laughs> shoes? But um, and then we're like, OK, let's go and eat. And I remember we ended up on like this main strip. where all like the bars were. And we went to one and we walked in. Do you remember they had like 150 different beers on yeah. tap? It was yeah. like the most amazing. I love beer. Yeah. I love trying different beers. So. Always. Anytime I travel, I'm always asking. You always got to try new things. I always got to yeah. do. It's like, why would you go to Mexico yeah, and exactly. have a Corona? Yeah, exactly. I mean, at least you know? like have a Modelo or something. Something. Right? something try different. something. If you're going to go in Germany and go have a Coors Light, yeah. there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you got to try something different. I always, I don't care if, even if I'm in a little town in Ontario, I'm like what's your local... You know, draft yeah. over here. You I'm, know, try I'm some different. the same way. So, um, yeah, I just remember we ended up at this restaurant, and uh, I think we ordered schnitzels. We did. We ordered a chicken schnitzel and one pork schnitzel. Wow. And, and it was uh, massive. The One of them was. But that's not what they brought us at first. First, they, they, brought us? Us, they brought us um, sausages. So, oh. I remember we started, they brought them to us, and we started eating them, and uh, then I think it was the manager or somebody who came up to us and was like, how's your food? We're like, oh, it's really good. And uh, I'm like, this is normally how you guys make schnitzel here? Because it was just like, obviously, like, you know, 
it was a sausage, but to us, we didn't like know him. Like, I didn't want to be rude and be like, this schnitzel is really weird, dude. And he's like, no, that's, that's a sausage. I'm like, okay, well, we ordered one chicken schnitzel and one pork schnitzel. And then obviously the two, the two beers. And he's like, I'll be right back. And he like runs to the back and he comes out with, you know, the pork schnitzel and the chicken schnitzel. And then he's like, oh, don't worry about it. Just keep the sausage or whatever. And uh, the, everything was amazing though. Holy crap, yeah, dude. Like good. I kid you not, like the chicken was like Yeah, it was, it was ridiculous. Yeah, I remember how tasty that was. Yeah, it was so good. And then um, the next day, what do we do? We went to, was it Auschwitz the next day? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think we went to Auschwitz. Um, how do you pronounce it? Auschwitz. I, I think pronounce. that's how you pronounce it properly. <laughs> Auschwitz. Auschwitz. Oh, I can't do that. Yeah. So the, a W in uh, Polish is typically pronounced with a V. Yeah. How do you know this? Because that's how they say it. Lewandowski. Remember the soccer player, Lewandowski? Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. So, I mean, it's pronounced with a V. So yeah, it's, it's cultured. Cultured, I guess. Right? I mean, I've been there. I might as well know how to pronounce great. stuff, right? So, um, yeah, Auschwitz was an interesting experience because I remember... Uh, driving from Poznan to Krakow, which I believe is about six hours, give or take. But obviously, you know, with Polish highways, you're going to get there probably in about four and a half, driving about 178. And I remember we were driving down the highway and there was a cop sitting there on the highway. We were doing probably oh, about 160 goodness. to 170. And Daniel's just going as fast as, because at the time I didn't drive stick. Daniel had some experience driving stick. So he was like, yeah, I'll just drive the whole time. It's fine. And uh, I remember we were passing this cop and he's doing just about the same speed as everybody else. And we were kind of like nervous because we're like, is it okay that we're doing, like the speed limit says 100, but is it okay that we're going 160 to 170 <laughs> on a corn, like on a curve? It, of it was a little, highway? it was a little excessive. I'm not yeah. going to lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, eventually we finally get to Krakow. We went to the Starry Square and uh, just looking at churches and, you know, typical Polish stuff. And um, at that point, I think that's when we were started looking for Auschwitz because mm. we're like, well, we're here. We might as well go and see it. Right. And um, I remember we were asking everybody, like the locals, like, how do you get here? We were trying to punch it into the GPS. Nothing was working. We punched it in the GPS. It would take us. It literally took us into the square. That's how we actually ended up there in the first place. I'm like, okay. Why would there be a concentration camp in the middle of the square? This literally makes no sense. No. So we're like asking the dude at the gas station, this dude, that dude. Finally, somebody's like, if you go up this road, you'll eventually see a sign and then turn left. As it turns out, it was completely an hour and a half outside of the city um, in the middle of nowhere, which, I mean, knowing you know, realizing what it was, knowing now makes a lot of sense. And uh, same thing, we were just still driving around. We were still getting lost. Like we could, no one would want to tell us exactly where this place was for some reason. Um, I think it's because the Polish people are a little bit uh, ashamed, I guess you could say. I mean, obviously the history of that place is, is pretty terrible, but eventually we finally made it. Um, we got there, I think within like what, an hour and a half before closing. So we only had so much time to see things. Um, for those that know Auschwitz, they know that it's actually two camps. So there's uh, Birkenau 1 and Birkenau 2. Uh, I believe Birkenau 2 is the famous one with the train station. So if you see the photos, uh, it's the famous one with the big train station in the middle. And then the uh, the other one is uh, the one with the big sign. I actually have a picture. Do you really? Yeah, I have a picture that... Um, so this is actually the picture at one of the games. That we went to. I remember when you did that. Yeah, yeah. They were giving free uh, face jobs at yeah. the time. <laughs> face jobs? Face jobs. <laughs> I don't know if that's, that's the right. I don't think that's the right. That? Yeah, oh, no, is that the right uh, <laughs> saying? <laughs> uh, hang on here. I got, uh, I think it's this one. Let me switch it here. What's this photo exactly? I don't even remember anymore. It does not want to work. There we go. Um, so that was the, well, the photo that I, the only photo that I took of Auschwitz. Um, this famous sign that says work will set you free, which we know obviously was wow. BS. Um, I got some other ones here. I got Daniel. This was his photo at the, looks like that was the what second I look like I had my shirt off. Cause you did have your shirt off. <laughs> did I really? Yeah. And it looks like you had a face job too. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> uh, and then I have, Hey, wasn't there a the video one? of us that there was online? Is, yeah. Yeah. I have it here. So we had such an amazing time. But, you know, before you show that other picture, mm -hmm. uh, talking about, you know, Auschwitz, mm -hmm. I got to tell you, it was 
Oh, uh, very surreal. Unreal. Yeah. You know, if you see people walking, yeah. people, it was a very somber very sort quiet. of quiet, very quiet. Yeah. People were not really speaking. People were not really walking fast. I believe everybody just, they were just historically kind of, knew yeah. the importance. They were just kind of taking it in. Yeah. Just kind of like have to. being there and you see Present. all of the, the victim's clothes, their Ooh. shoes. Remember the shoes? Yeah. The piles the of, of, oh my God. And I remember when we mm. went um, into the actual gas chamber, we didn't mm. even realize at first that it was the gas. So eventually the way they had designed it um, was that the gas chamber was uh, next to the incinerator. Like it was literally like there was a door separating the two. And at first I didn't even realize that. And then somebody mentioned that they're like, wow, imagine being in here in the gas ch chambers. And I'm like, this is the gas chambers. And then I look and you can see a pipe along the wall. And I'm just like, holy shit. Like it's, it, you, you feel emotional to say yeah. the least. Like there's just something about it. It's just totally overwhelming. Like, I, can't I can't imagine the feeling just oh, being in that place, knowing mm -hmm. what went on yeah. not too long ago. That's yeah. It doesn't matter what religion you are. No. Like as a human being, just mm -hmm. with a heart, just to feel the, the amount of emotion mm -hmm. that these people must have went through. Mm hmm and we're talking about sometimes we have bad days. Yeah. Sometimes we just need to reflect. Yeah. And bring, bring it back to things of how other people are living. Oh, yeah. But, like, you know, some of the poorest places in the world, these people are happy. Mm -hmm. You know, because they don't think about, oh, wow, you didn't get the new Jordans. You're going to cry for a week. Mm -hmm. This is what the new generation is. Meanwhile, these people are just grateful to be alive. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You know, and then you hear the stories of all the people who saved so many people. But, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people died and, and it was, um, it, to me, I got to tell you, it was, it was heart wrenching, mm -hmm. you know. And one thing that I kind of realized afterwards, too, because I started doing a lot more research after going on, like, a lot of the stories um, and, you know, everything that kind of happened at all these places. And one that kind of stood out to me was somebody pointed out that you don't hear birds. And then I kind of thought about it. I'm like, yeah, they're right. Like you didn't hear anything, which is kind of strange because where Auschwitz is located, it's in the countryside. There's lots of trees, lots yeah, of greenery. Exactly. So, I mean, normally with stuff like that, you would hear birds chirping and mm -hmm. wildlife and all that stuff. But there was, there was nothing, but it was just, it was unreal. I remember, um, putting my phone up to, um, the peephole into the, first gas chambers which were experimental and used for the experimental um were used for polish rebels which was when they used to pour in the chloron b or whatever it was called into like the top and the person would be in there um i remember you went into the standing cell i don't know if you remember that mm -hmm. so they would punish you and what they would do is you'd go into this little hole and they would just put you in this concrete box with 20 other people it was maybe like what four by four square yeah, feet wow. roughly Tight. and uh they would make you as punishment stand there without moving and you're literally you, you couldn't do anything and they would leave you in there for you know 24 days to up to i'm uh, sorry not 24 days 24 hours up to i don't know a week yeah two weeks and pretty crazy it was nuts man holocaust well, that was uh, that was really surreal so yeah. let's let's try to switch it up to some happy pictures yeah um okay so there is let me see if I can bring it up here. Um, I think it's this thing. There we go. So this is actually a video. You found this. I found this. And he yeah. sent it to me and he's like, Daniel, oh, you're never. Look at that. You're never right? going to believe what I just found. So and if I'm, you look right here. That's me that's right there. Daniel. And I would have been to the left of you. So I was like right here. Yeah. And then later on, we moved down like this way because we got tired of the Italian fans and we wanted to go and party with the Irish fans. Oh, because, they're the best. We're going to talk about that. Oh my God. But yeah, this is, this is an actual, that, that's it. That's our moment. <laughs> I'm here somewhere. I have, I had much longer hair back then. That, that was have, our moment uh, right there. That's yeah. Did you was... like that moment? <laughs> Mo? What are the chances of finding that? Right. How many views I, did that video have? 20? Uh, what? I didn't look at it. 20 yeah. views. This, Does it this, have 20 views? Yeah, literally relatively, 20 views. no offense, yeah. relatively unknown video, yeah. unseen video. <laughs> yeah. You found yourself, yourselves inside yeah. this video on YouTube. That's yeah. amazing. Dude, I'm wow. like, because I started looking at them and I realized that this guy had all these videos of inside the stadium. 
And I noticed where he was standing. I'm like, dude, this guy must have literally been standing right behind us. So I, went, I was going one day, I was going through all of his little videos. I mean, they're only like 20, 30 seconds long. And eventually I see the back of Daniel's head and I'm and like, yo. You see Carrillo, right? So right? Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. So it's a, it's a dead giveaway that that was us. And it was just so was cool. funny. Great just, find. It, yeah, exactly. Just kind of like reliving like an amazing experience. Um, and going back to that, parting with the Irish was like, like the Croatian people were cool. No, were nothing will beat the Irish. No. Did you no. know Why? that the population of, that was Ireland or Northern Ireland? Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. The population of Ireland was 4.1 million or something like that, mm -hmm. right? At the time. Did you know that uh, there was 41,000 people that came out to see them? Yeah. So that is what, what's the, what is that? Is that 1%? Point, yeah, it's like 1% or. I don't yeah. even know. Yeah, I probably. don't know the math on that. Yeah. Yeah. So long story short, they literally, that, was mm -hmm. that the first time that Ireland qualified for the euro i want to say i think I it was the first time i think it might have been like the second time was or it? something like that the Anyways. crazy part is that they had already been eliminated oh so whatever they did in that one game didn't even matter anyways because they weren't moving on and i remember talking to a lot of them and they're like we came here to drink we came here yeah, to drink. i remember a song <laughs> we're going and there's a bunch of them just partying and we're going and they're singing a song after they lost three you know three straight they're mm -hmm. out they're like a song you're never gonna believe this you're never gonna believe this you're never gonna believe this the dutch are worse than us the dutch are worse than us the dutch are worse than us and they're just singing they're having the, a good time they're having a good time and i remember we're having our italy jerseys yeah. i think it was to you and they're looking at you and they're like hey scalacci and he's like scalacci he goes you know he's just like random older yeah. players and all that stuff which was great and they were just like so like yeah. the happiest people. I had the most t fun partying oh, with those dude, people. Dude, that night were, it was a party. They were amazing because we were just walking around the square just over and over, just buying beer after beer. I mean, we didn't have to drive at that point. We just took a taxi to get back to the hotel. And uh, yeah, it was just beer after beer, partying with them. Because then once they realized we actually spoke English, which caught them completely off guard. Yep. Um, because, I mean... you would think that they would speak Italian, but apparently none of the real Italian people wanted to go. So the Canadian Italians decided oh, to go and support they, the they team. They missed the party in a half. Oh, like they that. did. Absolutely. It was... Uh, it what was, was that other song time. that they were singing? Oh, Trapattoni. He used to be Italian, but he's <laughs> Irish now. <laughs> because, because the coach of... He's Italian. Yeah. And he was actually... The Italian coach was coaching... The Ireland national team at that point. Wow. Mm -hmm. So they're just like kind of like, you know, playing with us and stuff like that. It was really, really cool. Yeah. But we had a good time. Oh, it was that amazing. Was it, was a, it was a trip of a lifetime, I'd say. It and was. There was one more thing that I remember happened yes. on that trip. And uh, we were talking about it before the show. Um, when we got bribed by the police <laughs> coming back, I think it was the day we were coming back from uh, Krakow. This is the first time I'm speaking about this in <laughs> 11, 11 years. years. Yeah, 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 just about, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I remember we were coming back from Krakow. We were still about an hour to an hour and a half out from Poznan. Uh, we were on the in the countryside, literally middle of nowhere. And uh, I just remember Daniel passing another car and it was obviously a solid line so he probably wasn't supposed to pass and then right at that exact moment two police waving us down pull over pull over uh so we pull over and uh they didn't speak a word of english we didn't speak very much polish other than maybe jin dobry and jinkuya right <laughs> and uh at that point they realized that we couldn't speak any english and uh daniel's like no Polish. I don't know what I don't know what you're trying to tell me. And uh, I just remember him writing a number that. on a pad, a pad of paper, showing it to Daniel and going Zloty, which is their currency. And Daniel's like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Zloty," and he's slapping his hand like, "Give me the money now, right?" And Daniel's like, "Come on, dude, are you serious right now?" <laughs> and uh, and then at some point, I'm trying to get out of the car. They're yelling at me to get back in the car, so I got back in the car, just waited. Daniel pulls out a wad of cash, gives it to them, and then just let us go i don't know what the deal was with that because normally we're used to like the way the system is here with that give was, you a ticket honestly then... that that bride was clean <laughs> it was fresh oh yeah it was direct mm -hmm. it was just like 
He knew exactly what he was doing. It was like, yeah, yeah he knew exactly. He what knew he was exactly doing. what he's doing. These yeah. guys know. You, you know, you're not speaking the language. You're tourists. Yeah. You're here for the game. Mm-hmm. They're never gonna I'm see gonna us again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're assumption... They know you don't want to get in trouble yeah. in another country. Yeah. Yeah. That was These guys are awesome. Pay. Story. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So uh, then, shortly after that, uh, because we got delayed because of the police, now we're outside of the city. We wanted to still watch the game. I think it was Poland versus Russia, or something. I don't even remember anymore. Um, so. So we we're entering this small little town there was one bar and we pull up we're both looking at this bar looking at each other like this is kind of sketchy right i don't know if you remember that i don't remember you don't i'm remember? not gonna lie so we we went to this bar in this little tiny town i don't think one person in this bar even spoke english at all and I remember the locals were trying to have conversations with us, uh, sharing drinks with us, whatever. And these guys were like speaking in Polish and like laughing and we're just laughing with him and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just remember turning to Daniel and like, keep an eye on the card just in case, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know. It was just so random. That was a solid trip. And that was the beginning. That was the beginning of your... Of uh, my soccer adventures. S- yeah, your soccer voyeur careers. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> I, I got it pretty down packed. Yeah. I would consider myself a, a soccer a, a soccer stalker. Yeah. But not nice. in a bad way. I'm yeah, not going yeah, to yeah. people's homes, eh? No, no, that's... No, we're just meeting people at hotels mm-hmm. and I'm jumping out of bathrooms, waiting there for four <laughs> hours and I jump out of a bush with an autograph. With a, you know, I think I've invested in like uh, Sharpies and mm-hmm. stuff like that. I think I own stock, you know, in Business Depot and Staples. Might and, as well, right? Yeah, so, you know, it's, 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 it's a pretty cool thing. Like I've converted my basement. I used to have like this... Um, it's almost like a dry... I used to have a dry sauna in mm-hmm. my basement. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not like 85-year-old yeah. slapping all of the branches the on my... Gonna use this you know, I'm not going to use this stuff, right? <laughs> and so we converted into like a soccer memorabilia room because that's the beginning of when we used to start mm-hmm. doing it. TFC, soccer players and stuff like that. And now we are like literally all over the place. I have like a crazy collection, but we don't buy signatures. We'll actually want to meet the soccer player. Mm-hmm. So having three kids, you know, my oldest is a son. He plays soccer. He loves it. He's outgoing. We started like little things like local, right? Like go see a little Canadian TFC game, meet a player, get a signature. The way it started was with me because... With the Roma? I think so. Was that the first time you guys got like meta That was a big one. That was was the... you know what? That was the first big yeah. signing. Yeah, I remember that because because uh, your son was very young. You have a jersey over there. Yeah, I have. Uh, so basically, what had happened was, um, so we went to TFC so, BMO yeah, Field. Yeah. So first, yeah, it was uh, Toronto FC versus Roma, and it was funny because Roma was literally playing like their fourth string players, and they annihilated them. And uh, but before the game, so I have a friend named Johnny, and he does basically the same thing and he was kind of like giving me tips and pointers on how to get uh, to meet these players because all I wanted to do was meet the Roma team that's all I cared about I didn't care about yeah. any of the other any other team or celebrities or whatever that was like my soccer team growing up and I remember the morning of the game uh, the night before he he calls me he's like yo you got to be at my house at like 6 30 in the morning I'm like for what and he lives in Toronto like Ossington and DuPont so I'm like for what He's like, Roma's practicing at the field at XX time. And I'm like, uh, okay, cool. Are we going to like meet the team? He's like, hopefully, right? So we end up going there and uh, we waited. The bus finally shows up. I'm standing there like a dumbass with my shirt and the marker. And uh, they're all just ignoring me. They're all just walking past. And, uh, and then I said in Italian to Totti, I'm like, oh, can I get your autograph? He's like, oh, after, after, dopo, dopo, right? So we had to wait around. And uh, finally, they're all one by... Was I think- there a lot of people there waiting? There was a few, yeah. So um, there was me. There was maybe like ten. That's it. Fifteen people during yeah. the practice. Yep. Yeah. It was a. What happened was it was a small little blurb on their website that said they were practicing that morning, so most people missed it. Oh my god! So, I would have been there. I would have gotten for sure because yeah. I'm like an expert in getting signatures now. Yeah. Well, now, but that was the very like before that whole thing started, yeah. and uh, I just remember Mike Khan coming out around the barrier. He puts his water bottle. He's like stretching. He's like standing like right in front of us. I'm like, whoa. Mycon, right? Like he was like pretty good player back for the for Brazil Absolutely, at the time, of course. right? He scored so a sick ha- goal, right? We're having uh, we're having a conversation with him, then he signs our jerseys, and then one by one, they all started coming out. I got Totti, the Rossi. Then the night of the game, I remember it was um, a disaster. 
Oh my God, I remember that. Yeah, it was so hectic um, waiting for them to uh, go in and out of the where the tunnel is to go into the actual stadium. Oof. And uh, I remember Totti noticed your son because he was he was young. He must have been like, what, four or five at the time? Something like that? No, so I think the story went like this. It was the police officer. That was after. That was actually after. Oh, you're the talking game. about before. So before the game, I remember Totti walking in, and he's and sort he of like, noticed. Yeah, he noticed your son because yeah. your son was the only one wearing a Roma jersey yeah, that yeah. said Totti on the back. And then there was the after. Yeah. Party. And then on the after, we ended up getting yeah. some signatures on the way out, but it was pandemonium. Yeah. I was using my son as a human shield. <laughs> yeah. And a human bait. lure. Bait. He was yeah, bait. He was a hook. He was the worm and the hook all combined. Yeah. You know, for me. Yeah. You know. And then. And, and so we put him down, and the cop, it was just pandemonium. Yeah. And we're like, we just want to meet Toti. And a cop, we we're right beside the door. Mm -hmm. And the cop took a liking to my son. Yeah. You know, good looking kid, short, yeah. well, cute. He was, he good was haircut. upset, right? He was, your son was visibly upset because that was the one thing he wanted. He, yeah, he, he got a bunch of other like autographs from like smaller players yeah. or whatever, but he was visibly upset because all he wanted to do was meet Toti and De Rossi, yeah. which were the two biggest players. And, the and De Rossi just kind of tapped him on the head yeah. and walked right in. Yeah. Mm. So it's okay. But then he, the police officer was like, okay. Give me your give me your jersey. Mm -hmm. So he took the jersey from my son, walked over to, to Toti's security, says sign this for this mm -hmm. little boy. That's amazing. Yeah. And got it. So that was, that, uh, that's a big one. That's yeah. in my memorabilia Shout room. Shout right out there. to the uh the Toronto cop who did that, whatever your name is. Respect. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> that's great. Respect Massive respect. You. That's why one of the things that anytime you're waiting for signatures, mm -hmm. You know, don't be an ass, you know, be be respectful to the security people that are around mm -hmm. because those are the ones that if you are respectful to them, they're the ones that will give you the most leeway. Oh, yeah. It's the Absolutely. ones that are acting like jackasses yeah. are the ones that they'll stand in front of to purposely mm -hmm. try to avoid, you know, and make your day a little bit harder than what it needs mm -hmm. to be. Yeah. And so we made, we befriended the security guards. So that's kind of like the journey of the beginning. And then we would go to different games and meet different players. And then before you know it, we're traveling to go to Italy. And the first time we went to Italy with my son, we went to go see, um, it was a Juventus, just, um, I think it was Champions League game. I think it was Manchester or something. I, I don't remember. No, that was a different one. That was oh. an older one. Yeah, but I'm talking about the too many to remember, yeah, right? Yeah, there, there's a lot. There's a lot. And so literally my son is still young, super, super young. And I'm like, listen, my son at this point is like, dad, we're going to go to the practice field. Mm -hmm. We're going to meet the players. Like he's very just like, yeah, it's going to happen because mm -hmm. we just started meeting a few players locally. But I'm thinking we're going to Europe. I don't know where the heck we're going. Mm -hmm. So then we have to do some research. So you start asking who knows what's going on. And then you say, OK, the practice field is over here, blah, 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 blah. Or like, how early do you go? They normally practice the day before. So you go the day before you wake up super early. You go to the practice field. And there's people from Germany. There's people from Japan, like literally from different countries waiting there trying to get signatures. And they had this literally, you know, fence. There's only a few people there. So as soon as people started going up, the first person that we met was a car pulls up. It was Grosso. <sighs> Grosso is the guy who yeah. won the World Cup for Italy, yeah. you know, with the wow. penalty shot famous, in famous 2006. Goal. A famous goal. Yeah. And so he comes up, we get a signature. We're like freaking out. We're like, we just met a soccer and player. This, this was in Italy. Yeah. Right. V v Venos, v oh, I forget the name of the place. Anyways, long story short is uh, they started coming in. Now, Jeep is the sponsor. Mm -hmm. So any player that drives in with a Jeep, you know, it's it's a local. I mean, it's an Italian because yeah. they have the driver's license. It's usually the foreigners that are signed that are not driving. They're being driven, right? So you're looking either in the driver's seat or you, if it's a Jeep, you know for sure the player's coming in. So all of a sudden a Jeep will pull in. We'd run right to the car because if you don't run in, the gate opens up and they just go right through. So we're like running right up. <laughs> My son wow. look cute. And they stop, get signature. So he's meeting like tons of players. We met mm -hmm. Buffon, like one of the greatest goalies of all time, you know, all that stuff. Me and all these people. And we wanted to meet one player. Guess who? Andrea Pirlo. Ooh, so legend. that was like our famous player, right? That yeah. was our, our favorite, favorite player. And we're thinking to ourselves, all of a sudden, they changed security guards. This new security guard comes out, and he's like, you guys can't run up to the car anymore. Mm -hmm. They put a, He put up a security uh, barrier. Oh, no. You got to stand behind there. If they want to get out of their car, walk. Do you guys walk? So I, everybody had to go behind this barrier. So all of a sudden, we're just standing there, and I'm like, I look at my son. I'm like, listen, nobody is going to get out of their car 
and come say hi to us. Yeah, right. exactly. It's not going to happen. So this is what we're going to do. We didn't come here to Europe mm -hmm. just to come and not meet Pirlo. We're going to meet Pirlo. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to do, Daniel. He goes, okay, what are we going to do that? I said, if we see Pirlo, I'm going to lift you up over the bar and you're going to run past the security guard. Oh, wow. And you're going to run straight to the car. <laughs> I said, don't get hit. Mom's going to kill us. <laughs> I said, but... It might be worth it. Yeah. <laughs> so long story short, we see Pirlo driving like this and we're like right over here, cars coming in like this. So we could see him mm -hmm. coming in. I mean, at, like, the time ready? The, at the time he had the big beard. So it yeah. Was easy to so you're like, you ready? You ready? You ready? He goes, yeah, yeah. So I was like, throw him over. He's boom, books it right through this past security guard. Security guard, she, by the time he gets to the car, Pirlo rolls down the window. Yeah, I, I jumped over the bar because I wanted to get a picture, you know? So I jumped over, I took a picture, da, 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 da. He was so excited. He all of a sudden he goes in. All you see these kids, some kids from Ireland, Japan, <laughs> they're crying. They're like, oh, no. and I'm like, hey, listen, sometimes you got to break the rules. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you want to, if you want to become a professional soccer stalker, you got to break the rules a little yeah. bit, you know? So that was our first one. And we're like calling Sandra back home in Canada, yeah. freaking out, like, you're never going to believe it. We just met Andrea Pirlo. Now, to yeah. anybody who doesn't know anything about soccer, which is yeah. football and you know, anywhere else around the world. Mm -hmm. This is a very well-recognized individual. Yeah. For people who don't follow soccer, they're like, oh, big deal. No, it's like, it's like, it's like life. Yeah. He's yeah. grande, you know, yeah. he's huge. So it was a big deal for us. And then we went to the game, we had a blast mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And we had multiple experiences where we would get like really cool tickets um, where we're in the parking lot where the players park. So there's a VIP entrance. So as the players are walking out of the tunnel back to their cars, we're literally meeting the Juventus soccer players, which is our national, our, our local club team. And we're meeting these players as they're walking to the car. We're meeting like these the crazy players. Mm -hmm. And then we would go to different places. We go to the States when they did the International yeah. Champions Cup. We would go meet Bayern Munich. We'd go meet Real Madrid. We'd find out what hotels they're staying at. We would befriend people there. We met the owner of Real Madrid. That's crazy. You know, which is great. And just hanging out with just incredible people. And then we went to, I'm going to tell you the pretty cool story. I got a couple of stories. I got mm -hmm. one is when we went to see Ju Juventus versus Real Madrid, we stayed, actually, no, it wasn't. It was Real Madrid was just playing Chelsea. And we stayed at the hotel, uh, the Mandarin Orient or the Orient Mandarin or something like that really the high-end hotel gorgeous and it, it was it was a decent like decent place did you stay at the hotel too yeah yeah, yeah it was it was nice it was mm -hmm. nice it was great it wasn't like overly crazy it yeah. was maybe like 600 us a night oh that's not that bad but it was like top notch yeah so anyways you pay the extra to go to the club level so you can get the food you know how you get the different level you can mm -hmm. get food at whatever so we're just there and we're like freaking out because we just met a handful of players walking in and all that stuff i went to the club level because i'm always got to get snacks for my son you know yeah I'm just like the dad that just like, yeah, okay, I'll get it for you. No problem. How old was he? Uh, at that time, I'm, I got to say, he was probably 12, nice. I'd say, give or take, 11 or 12. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, I'm going up and I meet this guy and he's by himself and we're just in the club together and he's wearing a VIP tag. And I'm like, oh, VIP. I said, you must be a very important person. <laughs> right? He looks over at me and he kind of giggles. He goes, well, maybe some people would say. I said, well, if so, I got to meet you. My name is Daniel. What, you know, I'm from Toronto. What's your name? Oh, da, da, da. I said, well, yeah, the, you know, I'm a huge fan. You know, I travel. I love to go see games and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, what's your role here? He goes, well, I kind of run the security. Mm -hmm. We ended up. I ended up befriending a gentleman who I'm still friends with to this day. I'm not going to give up his name. Mm -hmm. And long story short, he actually is the in, in the head of security when any international champions cup comes to the United States. Oh, wow. He's the head of security that manages all the security there. Mm -hmm. So I was telling him how much, you know, we're there with my friend and, uh, you know, uh, my son and his friend and so on and so forth. I'm like, man, I, you know, it would be a dream if you can give him a VIP experience, I said, that would be so cool. I said, you know, we'd owe the world. I you was know, just buttering up a little bit. And we were just totally cool, just hitting it off. He goes, okay, you know, give me your number. Let's see what I could do. So we're downstairs. A few hours later, he texts me. He goes, come up to my room. So I go to his room, knock on the door. He opens the door. He goes, hey, here's three bracelets. I said, uh, you know, go to, you know, the stadium. Walk on in. Tell him you got it from me. And, you know, they'll, they'll let you in. And we're like, we don't even know what these bracelets mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So I go to Daniel. I said, you're never going to believe it. We've got these bracelets. I don't know what they're for. I said, but it's going to be really cool. So all of a sudden, we put on the bracelets. It's the day of the game. So we go outside to the ticket. We're like, and I keep pointing to the bracelets. So the whole theme was, I'm pointing to the bracelet. I'm like, you're never going to believe it. I just got these bracelets from the person. I said, the person's name, head of security. And he told me, he goes, I can get down to the field mm -hmm. with this ticket. And they're looking at the bracelet. They don't even know. They're like, oh, okay. So they let us in. So we're like, we don't know where to go. So we walk down the stairs, we go to the grass. We're like, oh, we're supposed to get these tickets. We're supposed to be on the field. They're like, not here. Go to the, like, you know, concierge. Go to yeah. concierge. Da, 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 da. Okay, you know what? Go down the hall, make a right. There's an elevator there. And then try that. So we go down the hall elevator. There's a man with a security guard. I said, I, you, don't, you don't know me, but my name is Daniel. He goes, he goes, you know, the head of security gave me this bracelet. Mm -hmm. He told me to come here so I can get onto the field. He looks at the bracelet. He goes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he opens the elevator. We go in this elevator. We get off the elevator. We go down like a couple floors. We the elevator opens. We see people pushing carts, like workers. Oh wow! We don't see any fans. We're walking. All of a sudden, some guy looks at me. He goes, "What are you doing here?" You know, security <laughs> guard. He goes, "No, you don't understand." He goes, "I just got this bracelet from da 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 da." He told me to come down here. He goes, "Go along the the you know you know the tunnel and get on the field." He goes, oh, you got it from that guy? He goes, yeah. He goes, oh, okay. Keep walking straight, da 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 So wow. we start walking straight. All of a sudden, we see, like, family and friends of the team. Wow. And we're, we're crossing through. Like, you know where we're fans buy VIP tickets, and they're, like, behind, like, a cage waiting for fans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're walking that path right yeah. now. And I'm thinking to myself, I just bought a regular ticket yeah. at this point. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so all of a sudden, we finally get to the point where we see the light of the tunnel to go onto the field. We're about to walk out. This is before the game. Some guy comes up to you. He goes, excuse me. He goes, are you lost? I said, no. I said, I got this wristband from this guy. <laughs> His name is blah, 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 blah. He goes, oh, you got it from him? He goes, yeah. He goes, oh, great. And, let me... and so we walk onto the field. And right now, we are literally on the field with a few family friends of the players and the commissioner of the MLS. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the amazing. commissioner is having an interview, MLS. The guy, I finally get there. I see the head of security comes over. He goes, hey, man, I told you I get you. I said, thank you so much. You have no idea. And this is now the, the players would just run right by us. He goes, listen, man, you got to stand over here. Just stay over here. Don't move. Da, 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 da. I have no problem. So every, you know, you know, every time, you know, he's not looking, we're moving up a couple inches. <laughs> by the time... The game is about to start that people are, are the players are about to come out. We're like literally right there. You know, like when kids come out and they're, you know, they're high fiving the players as they come out, yeah. like maybe like local charity kids, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So kids are out there and with white t-shirts. Yay. And then you see a dad with these two kids with <laughs> soccer jerseys. You know what I mean? They're out as well. So we get out and it was Arsenal versus Real Madrid. Oh, wow, that's a cool game. It was Arsenal versus Real Madrid. So all of a sudden, we literally have them, and now we had we gave players, 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 gained signatures. We met Benzema. Mm -hmm. So I have a Benzema France jersey, uh, Couture, uh, Hazard. Mm -hmm. So I got, like, some serious, crazy signatures and some other ones from the, from the hotel and all that stuff. And that was our experience doing there. And then we, another time, you know, I think it was, like, the, the day after arsenal was practicing somewhere so we just figured out where the arsenal teams are do we follow this guy from arsenal then they're going there and then they came out of the hotel then they went to the practice field so we followed them with our rental car we go down to the practice field and we're just waiting there and we met like tons of arsenal players there and we're just having a time of our life you know chasing the arsenal bus i got like video of us like you know like hey the arsenal's right in front of us <laughs> and we're just going crazy and the kids are having a blast and that was like a great experience that we had there That's I, cool. yeah that was really cool i almost spilled my espresso there but um you know that was just one of many i have um two other really cool ones do i have time yeah yeah okay so which one do you want to hear first? You want to hear the Ronaldo story or do you want to hear Qatar? I was actually just about to ask you the Ronaldo one. So you, it's I remember you sick. saying the story about how you, well, you, you tell the story. Okay. It's, it's good. You know, Cristiano Ronaldo, probably one of the best soccer players ever mm -hmm. played, you know, ever, you know, regardless of how anybody feels, it's just truth. Right. Mm -hmm. And long True. story short, <laughs> he's one of the best. Hey, I didn't man, say I, the best. I could care less. They're both great in their, in their own ways. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people will argue Messi's better when all those men. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it Who doesn't cares? matter. He, he did pretty well. Yeah, he did pretty well for himself. So 
all of a sudden we're like, okay, we got Champions League tickets. We're going to, this is when he's playing for Juventus, the Italian team. They're playing a Champions League game in Manchester versus, you know, Manchester United at Old Trafford, which is like one of the most historic, mm -hmm. you know, places to watch a game, you know, football match. So we're about to go to England. It's me, my son, my brother-in-law, Franco, and Sam, one of the guys that works with us, great guy. And so we go to England for four days to go watch this game. And my son's like, Dad, we're going to meet Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> I'm like, dude, this guy's like, at that time, he was yeah, the peak. He was He was peak. He was the man. Yeah, he was the man at that point. And it's like, how are you going to meet the most profiled, most followed human being on earth? Because he is the most followed person on, mm. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, we're like, no, Dad, we're going to meet him. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so now my, my brother-in-law doesn't want to do any soccer stalking. Mm -hmm. So we get to England. When you think of like rainy, dark, and gloomy, Manchester, oh, yeah, you know, 100%. just it's what it is. Yeah. So we get there and we're like, okay, Franco, we're going to go to different hotels. Okay. It's okay. See you later. Call me when you find him. He's <laughs> yeah, like, he's do his own thing. he had he zero care. interest coming, you know, with us. <laughs> yeah. Now we had to do some pre homework mm -hmm. before we got there. So we stayed at one hotel. But I started saying, okay, who knows people who live in Manchester? So my mentor had a cousin that lived in Manchester. She tells me, oh, they usually stay at this hotel. But I'm thinking, man, it's like 45 minutes away from the city. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. I said, okay, let me just get one night there. But So I double booked myself. So I got one night. And it was pretty pricey too, right? So we got one night. So we went to all hotel hopping, hotel hopping, all loco. Couldn't find him, couldn't find him, couldn't find him. The next day we're like, oh. So we do sightseeing a little bit, all that stuff, nothing special. So we finally go to that other hotel, take an Uber out, 45 minutes away. We get there, all of a sudden we're, we're soccer stalking, looking around, you know, walking around. All of a sudden we see this sign that says Juventus. I'm thinking to myself, my son, I'm like, oh my God, they're here. Anyways, it was the Primavera team. It was the younger oh. team that didn't, that doesn't stay with the, the first team. Mm -hmm. So it was all the younger players, but it was kind of cool because these are all the future yeah, too. Yeah. So we met a few of them, which was really cool. And they're like, no, they're not staying here. I'm like, ah, oh, crap. So we ended up leaving, go back another 45 minutes, hotel, 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 didn't find anything. Now it's game day. So go to the game day, you know, go to an Italian restaurant, went, went to a nice steakhouse and then went to the game. They won. It was crazy. We got home, but went to an Italian restaurant, drank, ate. By the time we got in, it was like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. We had to wake up at 6 o'clock to go to the airport. It was just an early start, right? We wake up. We're going to the airport, and my son is like, Dad, could you imagine if, if, the, if the team is at the airport? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that would be so cool. So I'm wearing my Juventus jersey, another one, a fresh one. So we walk in, and the security goes, oh, hey, Juventus is going to be walking here quite shortly. Oh, man. And I'm like, what? Uh, like here like the same steps that i'm taking he goes yeah and i'm like cool. what time is their flight yeah their flight is at uh 10 50 you know or something like that and our flight was like maybe an hour before them okay mm -hmm. so i'm like we're gonna miss them there's no you know we're gonna miss them you know they these soccer team doesn't come two hours before that's yeah. right you know they have security clearance they go through a little bit quicker right so i'm thinking to myself okay we we have to go to frankfurt first so so from England, we go to Frankfurt. Then we had a five-hour delay in Frankfurt. And then Frankfurt to Toronto. So we're, we're flying with Lustanza. Great airline, by the mm -hmm. way. Great airline. Really super nice people. And so all of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, okay. I started looking at flights. I'm like, wait. There's another flight that's leaving two hours after ours that goes to Frankfurt. And I could still make the flight from Frankfurt to Toronto. Mm -hmm. Let me try to change my flight. So I go to the desk. Inside, I passed security already. So I go to the counter. I'm like, listen, you're not even going to believe me. Da, 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 da. We want to meet the Juventus players. And this is our dream. And we're telling these ladies our dream. It's okay, let me look up. Da, 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 da. She goes, oh, there's only two seats. I say, yeah, don't worry about these guys. Just me and my son. <laughs> okay. so, so she's like, okay. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, you can't do it unless you have only carry-on. We only have carry-on. So it's bonus. Two seats left, only have carry-on. And she's like, okay, let me check. Da, 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 da. She goes, um, okay, let me call Air Canada. She calls Air Canada. Now they're boarding. Okay, they're, they're getting on. Frank was like, good luck. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you get them. He's like, see yeah. ya. So all of a sudden they're on. Oh, yeah, you, we can get you on, but there's going to be a fee. And I said, what's the fee? They said uh, $3,000. Ooh. Ouch. Per person. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, That's $6,000. Oh, and no. I, I looked at my son and he, I said, Daniel, I said, 
Sandra's going to kill us. Yeah. Mom's going to kill us. I said, we can't do this. He, and you know what? He was actually with a sad face. He yeah. looks, yeah, I know, Dad. I know. So I'm like, okay, just, you know, so they took us off the flight to try to rebook us. Because I'm like, yeah, just do it, do it, do it. So now they took us off. And all of a sudden, the guy goes, sorry, we got to go. And they shut the door. That means now we can't get on the flight. Mm. And I'm thinking, all I'm thinking about is $6,000. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And so uh, it's not the matter of the money. Yeah, yeah. It's a matter of the frustration that my wife's going to have. Like, yeah. why would you spend yeah. $6,000 uh -huh. unnecessarily, right? But if we could meet Ronaldo, it would be all worth it. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I, and he, so they're like, we got to get you back on. We got to get you on a flight. Mm -hmm. You're not even in a flight. You're past security. You're not on a flight. You can't even be here. Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay, we got to call Air Canada again. And then she goes to the, uh, my son, she goes, okay, leave your bag here. Why don't you go to the, you know, the gate over there where they're where it's torino they're flying to torino italy see if they're there and come back he runs and he goes dad dad, dad you're never gonna believe it the, the team's there the team's there they mm -hmm. just got there da, 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 da. i'm like okay you know when they say don't leave your luggage unattended yeah i opened up my luggage left it there i told the ladies i said i'm i'm leaving it here we grabbed jerseys we ran over and my son's like really fast. So he's a little small so he's like bolted mm -hmm. by the time i'm getting there i'm like trying to get on my video as i'm jogging and so by the time the security guard, he's like, Ronaldo. And all of a sudden, Ronaldo's like this. So the cop opens up this little gate and he walks right in, has a signature from Cristiano Ronaldo. I have it on video. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, which is really cool. I have it on video. Takes a signature, takes a selfie, and, uh, you know, talking to a couple other players, which was like so cool. And my son's face was like, ear to ear mm -hmm. it was like the best feeling in the world and he comes over just with glee and then i i met a couple other players i you know i had a couple of the jerseys and i got some signatures which was really cool but that was the greatest moment i gotta tell you in our in our moment right there and then mm -hmm. and we're coming back we're like we met him we met him we met. because <laughs> i don't care about the six thousand dollars anymore i said it was totally worth it <laughs> worth so all of a sudden it was like you got to come leave and we got to put you back through security we got to leave through security and get you rechecked in so I'm on hold, Air Canada says, listen, because it was uh, an administration error on our part that we couldn't get you back on, we're going to get you on this next flight to go to Frankfurt, and we're going to waive nice. the $6,000 fee. Wow. So we got back on the plane, the next flight, waived the $6,000. We get into Berlin, uh, Frankfurt, my apologies, and all of a sudden we're running through the airport, and Franco's on recliners. You know, he's just chilling. <laughs> And we're like, we met Ronaldo. We're like flashing. <laughs> we met Ronaldo. We met Ronaldo. And it was like the funnest moment ever. So that was our Ronaldo story. That's a great story. That's Imagine amazing. all the memories that you've given your son just Ooh, in that. Oof, right? Buddy, you have no idea. That's incredible. I have a really cool one. Like the, the guitar one is probably as good, if yeah. not better. So like, so you went to Qatar for that's, the World Cup. That's true. Right? Well, what year? Was that? That was 2022. Last year, last year. Right? yeah yeah so what was that like first of all i gotta i but to be brutally honest i thought these people are going to be dragging their knuckles when they walk what, what do you mean yeah because i thought it was like middle east mm -hmm. I, I didn't know this all you week. expect is sand yeah. white robes sand people <laughs> yeah. like rude yeah. i didn't i didn't expect that i mean i was like, so i was so oblivious yeah. i was so naive and i was so honestly i was an idiot yeah walking in there my expectation was totally blown away. I would actually personally visit that country. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't go for a week, but I would go for a couple of days again. Yeah. That's how beautiful the people were. I fell in love with the culture. I mm -hmm. fell in love with the people. I fell in love how they treated people. Yeah. They're the most respectful mm -hmm. people I've ever met. Well, I should, I should go because as of recently, I found out that I'm 19.9% Middle Eastern. I don't know if I'm from oh. Qatar. I did a DNA test for oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a promo a little while ago. Apparently, I'm 19% Mediterranean. Oh, that's, I'm that's, also Greek. That's um, hilarious. 51% Italian. Yeah, you definitely so. belong there in Qatar. Absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely. I don't know. <laughs> so this was, this was a dream trip. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they had it in the winter, right? Yeah. Because it was just it's too just hot too to hot, do in the yeah. summer. But they built the World Cup literally just for this event mm -hmm. and they have these stadiums like they have a stadium i forget the name of it but i think it's like um 692 or 794 or something like that but it's a stadium where they have it's all based on um shipping crates oh i heard that oh, yeah. yeah and so what they do 
is they will take these shipping crates and they will literally package them up. They'll put the whole stadium in these shipping crates and they literally will ship these crates to another country. And here you go. We'll put together, we'll Lego it back together for you. That's why. So it's a portable stadium. Like think about the ingenuity. Think about the advancement. Think about like the thought process behind that. Yeah. It's, they are they are way ahead of us. Their subway system was to die for. Mm -hmm. Quick, easy, simple, fast, safe. You know what I mean? Just beautiful. The transportation, even like Uber, the trusting system of the culture. Mm -hmm. Like um, I lost my my iPad in the airport uh, when I got back. It was there. It was there. Yeah. Um, one of the guys that we went with, we had a guy from B, from out west, BC, Brad Gerard. Mm -hmm. uh, we had somebody from uh, New York. We had somebody from California meet up with us. You know, our friend from out west, he forgot his cell phone at the game. Wow. Did you know that somebody returned it? Wow. Amazing. Like, and so the guy in the Uber was telling us that their culture, as a lot of them, um, you know, say that stealing is just like non-existent. Like, yeah. that's just not what you do. The word, the, the word in that part of the world is haram. haram it's the opposite yes. of halal. Yeah. So yeah. I, I wonder, though, and this is just asking, just generally asking, mm -hmm. is that because it's like part of, I mean, I understand that it's part of the culture. Like you said, it's considered haram. Mm -hmm. um, but it is it also, because I know their politics kind of works a little bit different over there. So is it also out of maybe fear of the government that they're a little afraid to do things? So like, especially to a tourist. So right? a lot of the people that are Uber drivers are mm -hmm. foreigners. Yeah. Right? Because the population of Qatar is 300,000 people. Small. Did you know that every Qatari gets paid twenty thousand dollars a month? That's crazy! Wow! Just for being a citizen. Now, what can twenty thousand dollars buy you? Like in, like so you're saying so the majority they get... of all Qataris they don't yeah. work. Okay. And so anybody who's dressed in all in white, that means you're a Qatari. Okay. And if if a woman marries a non Qatari mm -hmm. man. And he, all the kids will not get the money. Mm. But if a man marries a non Qatari, then it's still considered. Mm -mm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So $20,000 a month. So all labor, all physical jobs are not done by locals. You'll never see a Qatari working physically. It's just not going to happen. So what they'll normally do, they'll work like high end jobs, government jobs. Yeah. You know, they're organizing events, stuff like that. They're managers of this and that and so on and so forth. It's incredible yeah. how. Streamline. Uh, can I show you something? Yeah. I, I don't even know if it's. I don't even know if I could pull up. You can pull up the camera. So watch this. So this was. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, I could. That marks there. Yeah. Yeah. It's right in the camera. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I had stitches. Yeah. So literally day one, I get there, and uh, my son's like, "Oh, let's play a game." <laughs> All my my son's. You know, at this point, he's you know what sixteen. He just turned sixteen. Yeah. He's like, let's play a game. So let's jump from here to there, dad. So from, you know, cement yeah. stair, jump up. Mm -hmm. So we did it. Then he goes one down, jump higher, one down, jump higher. And I just keep copying. We're finally mm -hmm. getting to the bottom. I jumped and I hit the curb and my toe slipped and, and my shin hit the cement Ooh. and boom, lifted up my skin. And it was day one. We just got there. Wow. So we go straight to the, <laughs> to the, to the <laughs> hospital and, uh, my son's like, I have a picture of my son like this, you know, in the, in the ambulance. <laughs> He's like, crap. And we go there and we had top-notch service. Yeah. First of all, medical is free for mm -hmm. all foreigners. Nice. You don't have to pay for it. And if, specifically for the World Cup, anybody who travels there for the World Cup, also health healthcare is for free. Oh, amazing. So I got top-notch service. I got stitches. Um, I got uh, 24 stitches. Um, all for free. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And they sent me off and I was a couple hours later, I was rocking and rolling, maybe a little bit sore, yeah. but I was rocking and rolling, which is great. And they did a bang up job. And so that was my experience going there. And it's just like the love and care yeah. that they did for you is incredible. And then, um, you know, going to different places, uh, eating at different restaurants, their food was incredible. Um, a lot of dips, a lot of sharing platters, stuff like that. 
uh, shisha. Mm. I never really was into shisha, but they had like different flavor shishas, mm -hmm. which is really good, like watermelon and different, you know, I think flavors. It's like a thing here too. Right? It is a thing yeah. here, but yeah. it, to me, it was just like I'm not going to go to Brampton to go do shisha. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. I'm not going to Scarborough. It's different do, if you're there. Yeah, right? I'm in yeah. Qatar. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? So stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, people, were not, women don't look at you in the eye. So if you're walking, women will not look at you in the eye. Mm -hmm. And so me and my friends were all just like. I said, Daniel, try to get a girl to look at you. Like he could not, <laughs> he could not do it. None of us could do it. We just were into a game. We were God. unsuccessful, <laughs> right? But one of the things is like they warned us is that you got to be respectful. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, no swearing, no no littering. You know, and they're pretty respectful like that, which is great. Police were really all out there, uh, extremely nice, trying to help everybody. Now the thing about the World Cup is that this is the only World Cup ever in the history where you had all the games literally happening in almost like one little city. Mm -hmm. And they had stadiums that were close enough that you could Uber from place to place. It was crazy. So how many stadiums did they have? Mm, that's a good question. I don't Probably know if you like, can figure that out. Maybe like eight to ten or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, look up look up how many stadiums they had in the Qatar World Cup. Yeah. So yeah. if you're saying it's like one city, like let's say they had ten stadiums. 10 stadiums were all literally in one yeah. region? Yeah. Kind of area? <clears throat> they had eight stadiums across five different Qatari cities. There you go. Yeah. And they're all close. You could yeah. Uber it from each one. This is the only World Cup in the history that you can go from game to game, game to game That's in wild. one area. And did you know that they literally closed, like you had to have access so locals could not come into these certain areas. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just like the stadium. I'm yeah. talking about closer to the stadium. They would lock it down. Yeah. So that literally crazy only people security. that were going there, that crazy security, wow. it was unbelievable. And um, going to the game was a fun experience. Um, we we obviously bought really sick tickets. We flew first class there, which was great. Um, and our VIP tickets, everyone's like, you're never going to drink beer. You're not going to find alcohol. Mm -hmm. Trust me, we had it. Yeah. Our VIP tickets, everybody was drinking. In the stadium? No. So you okay. can't drink in the stadium. You have right. to drink in the VIP area. Mm -hmm. And so you had to, you couldn't bring the drink out. Yeah. So you had to leave it there. Got it. So, which is kind of cool, but you had to pay for that, right? In wow. the stadium, anybody else could not buy alcohol. Right. Yeah. Okay. But if you had a VIP ticket, you could. So we we're out there having a great time. Every air, condi all air conditioned, the mm -hmm. seats were great. And we were sitting like in super awesome areas because I happened to hook up with the FIFA rep of all of Canada who wow. happened to be in Toronto. So when I went onto the website, you know, I was looking through how to get tickets. Then I saw this guy, FIFA rep. So I called him up and he's like, yeah, I'm in Toronto. I'm from Brazil, but I'm living here in Toronto just to sell tickets for the FIFA for Canada. I said, I got to meet up with you. I don't know if this is real. <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. So I met up with him. I ended up becoming friends with him. We got tickets through him, which was great. And he got us really good tickets. And we're literally sitting right behind, right, up, right in front, actually, of the boxes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the famous soccer players that are supporting certain teams and countries would come and be sitting there. So we met like Ozil, which is a wow, great soccer yeah. player, and different other players were around there. I'm going to talk about the legend story in, in a bit. But we even saw the Sheik, the king of Ooh. Qatar, and he doesn't come out a lot. Locals that were there were taking pictures, freaking out, because he doesn't make a lot yeah, of yeah. public appearances. That's wild. So he was there, and I'm, and I'm with one of the guys, and he's like, Hey, who's my daddy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because we had like a video. It was really cool. Like that guy is like, you know, he makes Elon Musk look poor. Yeah. Like it was just, mm -hmm. it was just ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. So had a great experience, start to finish. Food, culture, people, um, games, VIP experience, just everything was great. From entertainment, uh, music, everything was great. And then um, we went on a boat ride. Just. Everything was cheap. It wasn't like expensive, overly expensive to do things. Mm -hmm. They didn't gouge people. Like it was great. They didn't do this to make money. They did yeah. this to create exposure yeah, of, of what a great country yeah. it really was. And then they did a bang up job mm -hmm. better than and any other game probably, that I've ever seen. They probably stepped it up a notch too at the same time, right? To kind of just so that way when you go back, you're gonna be like, Oh my god, it was absolutely amazing. And then you know, yeah, they did all of this for us and then you know. But I'll tell you the good. coolest thing about it, Ange and yeah. uh, Mo is when we met, uh, we did some soccer stocking in Qatar. <laughs> now, I, I'm, now I'm here, you know, 10 years later, I'm a seasoned, you know, soccer stalker. stalker yeah. right? <laughs> so we're trying to get in to meet players. Now I'm thinking to myself, how do you meet players in Qatar? Mm -hmm. So the funny thing is, is that in Qatar, they actually had it posted which 
teams were staying where. Wow. So you knew exactly, and it was public. No, you, you just Googled this. Yeah, because <laughs> the hotel that I'm staying at, Costa Rica was staying there. Oh, wow. Oh, so we met the whole nice. Costa Rican team. Yeah. Well, that was easy. Navas, right? Yeah. right? Played for yeah. you know Real Madrid, PSG, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So we met a ton of different players, and which was really, really awesome. We went and uh, saw teams from Ghana. We tried to get into Brazil. You, you would die before finding getting those in players. Like, it yeah. was crazy. They had, like, a different entrance, different crazy... So now we're trying to say, okay, we found, met somebody who says, oh, the FIFA legends are staying at the Fairmont, mm -hmm. the Fair, Fairmont, Fairmont Doha. And I'm like, okay, so where's that? Oh, over here, da, da, da. I'm like, okay, let's go. I said, Dan, you want to go? Yeah, let's try. So we take an Uber, not knowing the Fairmont Doha, which if you look at it, you're taking a picture, you're looking at it right Good now. Good Lord, the look like, of this Can thing. you pull that up? I'm going to pull it up, yeah. Like this is, it's shaped as like a... It looks like a moon. Do like you a spell crescent. it? D-O-H-A. Oh, oh, D -O -O yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you actually look at it, it, like it is absolutely... Yeah, that one right there. Yeah. Uh, hell yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is crazy. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. Let me uh, see if I can bring this. There it is. So wow. picture, we're taking an Uber to go yeah. there, right there. Now, this hotel was just built a month before we got there. Oh, wow. Okay. And all the FIFA legends were staying there. So you think about every country has considered a legend mm -hmm. where they represent their country. All of them were oh. staying there. Wow. Now, to get in, you have to get in from the opposite side, obviously. Mm -hmm. And that's the side that we were at. So when we pull up, there's literally a gate, it's closed, security guards, guns, mm -hmm. and we're just walking up and we're like, um, sorry, you, you, you have a reservation here? I said, no, I said, but we're going to go eat. <laughs> so instinctively, we're going to yeah. go eat. Um, you have a reservation? I said, no, but, you know, they said they could just come because yeah. when I called, they said, no, you got to make a reservation. I said, do you mind if you dial the number and I'll call right now? So he dials the security guard, dials the number. And he goes, um, and, I, and I ring, ring, ring. I said, hi, um, you know, I'm just outside. They told me to call to get reservation. Oh, sorry, sir, we're fully booked. This is over the phone, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, sir, we're fully booked today. And it must have been like, I don't know, you know, maybe let's just say it's uh, Monday. And they're like, the next reservation available is Wednesday. That's like a couple of days later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they said a couple of days later is next time. I'm like, oh, okay. What time is available? Because right now it is 11 o'clock. We're saying like at that time, it was 11 a.m. You know, we want to come for lunch. When is the next availability? Oh, 12 o'clock. So I'm looking at the security guard as I'm on the phone and I'm looking at him. I'm like, 12 o'clock, 12? <laughs> and, he, and, and the security guard looks at me like, you're like this, right? Oh, yeah. And then um, and I'm like, okay, yeah, 12 o'clock works. I said, okay, can I just, can I just tell the security guard to open it? She goes, no, sir, you, we have to email you. And then you have to show that to the security guard. Oh, okay, perfect. So you're going to show, you're going to send me the email for 12 o'clock. <laughs> and the security guard's like this, like, yeah, 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 yeah. it's good. Yeah, that works. Just do it. Yeah. I'm like, okay, thank you so much. I hung up the phone. So I'm waiting, waiting, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. Finally, I'm refreshing my cell phone. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this damn Bell Canada. <laughs> 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 this Wi-Fi. And so all of a sudden, boom, the email comes in. Now, if I open up the email... If I open it up, it's going to say Wednesday a at 12. Day, yeah. It's going to say a different day. So I didn't open it up. Mm -hmm. All I did is I turned. I'm like, see, I got, you, a I got confirmation. Can I go? He goes, yeah, come on in. Oh. So he opens up the gate. Okay. I gave him a $10 bill as a tip, just so that he remembers mm -hmm. me. Okay. So that's, that's the kind of stuff that I do. And so all of a sudden, we walk up. And we're walking up that hill. And I'm like, oh, my God. And you hear music in the back. Mm -hmm. And I felt like. Oh my God, is this like heaven? Like, it was just <laughs> unbelievable. And as soon as we walk in, you know, we start seeing legends, Argentinian legends. We start seeing all these crazy people. And it was phenomenal. Okay. I'm trying to find uh, interior shots of the. Oh, yeah, uh, maybe. Hotel. Let's see if we can see. I'm curious as to. Oh my so dear. Is, is this look, like at, the... look at the lobby where I go to. Yeah. Crazy stuff. That's Look at the that. lobby? No, that's not the lobby. Go back. I don't know what this is. Right there. This? Left? Left? Oh, left? Yeah, right there. Wow. Ooh. Yeah, that's the lobby. Fancy. Yeah. Could you imagine just sitting there? Yeah. And, and people are just walking by. It was pandemonium. Mm -hmm. Because they were just about to have a FIFA Legends soccer game. 
And we're meeting people like Cafu. Uh, Ronaldo, number nine, was there, but we didn't see him. Yeah. We met Zanetti. The real Ronaldo, right? The, the real Ronaldo, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we met um, uh, Roberto Carlos. Oh, that's cool. You know, like yeah. a ton of different legends. Uh, Schneider, Mateus, you know, just mm -hmm. crazy, crazy legends. And we're uh, drug bar. We're just meeting these people. And my son's freaking out. Mm -hmm. We're taking pictures, getting autographs. You know, it was just, we were freaking out. You were the only people in that building doing that, probably, no? So the only people that were doing it were people that were staying there. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and that's it. So we happened to go to the back and just eat a little snack. So we stayed in the lobby the whole time. And we waited in that lobby for like three hours. Nice. Okay. Free Wi-Fi, espresso, snacks. We're good, mm -hmm. you know? And they are just coming out. We are just meeting them. And we were like video pictures, video pictures, video pictures. We met the president of FIFA. Yeah. Video pictures. The people had the most security. The only guy who had the security around him was the FIFA president. Mm. Everybody other legend was just on their own. It was crazy. And we walked out we, after they played their game and they, everybody went to the room. We looked at ourselves like, this will never happen again. Yeah. That's right. To do, unless you're with me, son. Like, <laughs> this is like the greatest opportunity. Like, I know people that do this for, like, they love seeing Sarah. Mm -hmm. And I tell them this story. They freak out telling me, like, I, I can't believe that. you. And I show them pictures of it because they don't even believe it. Yeah, no kidding. They don't even believe it. Yeah. And so these are the experiences that kind of... We have with our soccer stocking, and it was, <laughs> it's the greatest time of my life to do something with my, my best friend, my, yeah. my son. And there's a lot of memories. There's a lot of experiences. It's not the money I spent. It's the time. It's the experience. For me, you know, I listen, I, I like nice things. Like, mm -hmm. I have a nice car. I have a nice home. And okay, that's great and all, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, experiences is what you remember. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, I take you for a spin in my Ferrari. That's one thing. Yeah. But if you and I are going to be thinking about this Poland trip forever. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's going to remember yeah. 10 million times more important yeah. than just a drive in a car. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to remember that for, for depending on what you're shooting for. For mm -hmm. me personally, what motivates me is having experiences in life. Yeah. And I'm not a big fan on anything else but living life to the fullest. Therefore, I have a tattoo of that, mm -hmm. you know, and I believe that that's what life is all about is mm -hmm. living it and pushing to the, to the limit. Mm -hmm. And I believe that my purpose and my mission was to build a business, to grind, be successful so I can have the resources, yeah. so I can have these crazy things. And now people know me as the soccer stalker with my son and we just <laughs> meet crazy players. And guess what? We meet people that feed the dream to us they're like oh i know about this that's going on this time maybe you can meet them so i have people that are doing that i have people i had a person that sent me the tfc championship ring because they knew somebody worked at the mlse saying oh I i'm going to get you the rings i know how much soccer means to you wow so when you when you love a dream so much it's amazing how people will find fulfillment and joy to feed that dream mm -hmm. and that to me is really when you're living on purpose is when you are finding you're like in the matrix of life i'm in the matrix of life right now mm -hmm. i'm like just on this path and good shit is happening to me all the time and i expect good things because you know i i expect things i don't think of things yeah. i expect it to happen mm -hmm. And that's the sort of life that we're living right now. And we're having a great time. Mm -hmm. And um, thank God, you know, the kids are healthy, knock on wood. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all we care about. Because you can have all the money in the world. But if you don't have health, you know, that really sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And so having the time and freedom to build a business where you can be there for your family and your friends and do that kind of stuff and have experiences while you physically can. And because there's going to be one day when you're older, when I meet people that are like 80, 90 years old. You know what I asked them? I asked them, if you could be 20 years old again, mm -hmm. what would you do? What do you think some of the answers are? Oh, who knows, man? I think the number one is spend more time with my family. Oh, yeah, for I, sure. I got for that. Sure. That was the number one answer. Yeah. I, was, I would have spent more time with people that I loved. I would have told people who I loved. I would have told them I loved you mm -hmm. more often. Like this moment that we're having right now, mm -hmm. this is the moment that will never happen ever again. Yeah. This is a special moment and mm -hmm. this is going to be encarved in my heart and my soul and my mind. And I'm going to take every piece of this mm -hmm. and this means the world to me. So that kind of living in the moment and expressing your emotion, uh, I think is like, that's a godly spirit. And a lot of people tend to forget that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and not just that, but also like things like I would have pursued my passion. I would have taken more chances. I would have uh, tried to achieve more things in my life. I would have tried to do better things. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I didn't meet one person that ever said, I'm so grateful I worked at the union for 40 years. Yeah. I've never met That's one right. person that ever said that, you know, and I think that living on purpose. So I always say I'd rather live a life of purpose and passion versus leisure and pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh hundred percent agree with that. Um, you got a lot of, you gave us a lot of just sitting here across from you. And I, and I mean, I remember it from 10 years ago when mm -hmm. we were working together as well, but <clears throat> I just, I f I'm feeding off of your, your passion and your, just your love in your life. And I, I can feel it. And I know you can too. Um, a lot of highs we're talking about the life that you've led the the experiences you've given your family and your son now i remember an older story if you want to get if you're able to get into it mm -hmm. where you had a run and maybe that's not the right way to say it but you had meningitis when you were very got, got it twice twice mm -hmm. are you able to tell us the story yeah yeah uh so uh yeah so i had meningococcal meningitis and uh, that's like a, so basically it's like a complement deficiency of your immune system. So you have a low white blood cell count. Believe it or not, they don't even know what to give to me. So I'm on a lifetime prescription of amoxicillin 250 cap twice a day forever. So, wow. and when the first, when did you get the first time? So I got the first time around 19 years old. Okay. And um, it started with, uh, I was working at a pillow factory. With, us, with one of my buddies from the neighborhood. We're just like, let's get a job together, mm -hmm. you know? And I had a fever. And, uh, and, and um, I remember just, I had to go home, you know? So I go home and um, my, my, telling my dad, I was like, uh, you know, I'm feeling sick. My, uh, my mom came to see me because we went to the hospital first and my mom came to pick me up, brings me home. And my dad's a hairdresser. My dad's very spiritual. Mm -hmm. So he's got like two ladies waiting, doing someone's hair. He goes, you know what? Something's wrong. I just got to go home. So he, he leaves. And then, um, then all of a sudden, uh, I'm in the washroom. Now, when you, I'm, I'm literally at home. I have to get up. I have to go to the washroom. So I'm like dragging myself slowly to the washroom. When you go to the washroom, what do you do? You lock the door normally? Yeah. Normally, okay. Yeah. I always lock the door. Yeah, me too. I did not lock the door. Mm -hmm. So I went to the washroom. I did not lock the door. I was too lazy. I was too tired. So I just went to the washroom, sitting down, just like, I couldn't even stand up to pee. I had to sit down to pee. And all of a sudden, um, I passed out. And I went, Phew. So my mom, my, at this point, my, my dad's en route. My mom opens up the door, screams. Ah! My dad, five seconds later, opens up the door. He happens to come home. He hears it, runs up comes up to me, grabs me, throws me in a car, does not call 911, mm. throws me in a car, drives me to Sunnybrook Hospital straight from Keelan 401 area, and just drives straight, brings me to a merge, and, um, you know, he's like, they're like, listen, if you waited another two hours, this kid would have been dead. Uh, you know, and they brought me back to life. I was sort of not breathing at that point. Um, and which was great. So I stayed in the hospital for two weeks. Then a year later, they didn't put me on any vacation. A year later, um, again, I was working somewhere. I got a fever and I told my buddy, I said, I, I feel like it's coming on again. Yeah. Wow. And my buddy's like, he told the manager, my son, my buddy, he's sick. He's got to go to the hospital. No, no, no. He's good. We, you know, we're not going to go to Sunnybrook. We'll just go to another place. So they bring us to like, uh, the hospital on major Mac and it wasn't a specialist hospital. And they're like, oh, we're going to just do a spinal tap. So they did a spinal tap. My mom comes pick me up, you know, and brings me home. And then all of a sudden, uh, same situation. I'm home. I'm not feeling good. Uh, go back to the hospital, you know, the right, right hospital. They bring me to Sunnybrook. By the time I'm getting there, I'm like passing out. I stop breathing. Mm. I'm in the hospital, you know, like clear. Yeah. The defibrillators. The defibrillators. Yeah. They had to bring me back to life with a defibrillator. Mm -hmm. And uh, my whole family's there 24 hours later. The doctors come to my parents are like, well, we don't know his status. We don't know if he's going to make it tonight. So maybe you want to, you know, do what you want to do. Like, what would you do in this case? So uh -oh. they, being Catholic, they called the priest. Mm hmm so the priest from our church comes to the hospital to read me my last rites. So could you picture parents 
witnessing a priest saying your last rites to their, their kid mm -hmm. with confidence that the doctors are not hopeful that your son will make it. Like, could That's you imagine wild. the feeling? There, so I was dating my wife at the time, so she was there. Mm -hmm. And there must have been about 30, 40 people there wow. at the hospital, family, close friends, right? And I made it through the night, and that was the most important thing. And I was in a coma for a good solid week, you know, sleep-induced coma. And the doctor says, listen, he's had no oxygen. Yeah. You know, there could be some issues, maybe speech, you know, areas, could be walking, it could be anything. You don't know. When it affects the brain, when it affects the brain, lack of oxygen, it could cause anything. Mm -hmm. Lack of sight, lack of this, lack of that, right? And I woke up, um, you know, and I remember my brother-in-law, you know, he comes into the room. My mom was right by my side when I woke up and she started bursting of excitement of tears. Mm -hmm when I woke up and then my brother-in-law, I see him like literally a couple minutes later and I'm like half toast, right? Yeah. In bed. And he's like, what do you want? I'll give you anything you want. You want a car? <laughs> you want a house? You want everything? I'll get, you tell me anything you want right yeah. now. I will get it for you. Yeah. And I'm like this, true story. Water. <laughs> he goes, you're such an idiot. He goes, I would have bought you a car. I would have bought you anything. And he oh said, you're God. a dumbass. You water. asked for water. At the and, time, that's what you needed, right? And so uh, I remember going to the to the uh, to the uh, emerge and seeing the doctors who saved my life a couple mm -hmm. weeks later when I was able to. And you know, it was a very surreal process, right? And a lot of people ask me, you know, did you see the light? Did you, you know? Did you meet the Holy One? Yeah. Um, actually, I didn't. It was no. just, I was very blacked out. And um, you don't remember anything? I don't remember anything. No. I don't remember anything. And some people say that's that could be it. I think it's with cancer patients. Mm -hmm. They have hallucinogenics where they, they get a psychedelic feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's the people who survive it. Those are the ones that usually will say that. Yeah, it's like some sort of like adrenaline or yeah, something. Correct. Right? I think even my mom too, because my mom had a major heart attack when I was... 18, 18 i think right yeah. and they had to do the same thing though the clear right and wow. uh she remember all she remembers was just slowly fading to black she just remembers them calling out code blue or something like that yeah. um while she was coding in the hospital yeah same thing she doesn't remember any like white lights or anything like that who knows but well, listen we you know i wasn't really a bad kid before that mm -hmm. but man what a difference of life of just appreciation perspective 100 yeah. percent. like you know waking up every single day like every day is your life in miniature mm -hmm. i don't care what anybody mm. says so if you ever meet me i always make every experience count mm -hmm. every experience with if i go grocery shopping the cashier the person helping me i open the door for somebody getting mm -hmm. gas people around me please and thank you smiling you, you never know what one small gesture yeah, exactly could actually make an impact in someone's life and that's the way i choose to live my life because you know joy is something that is a gift from above and if you can make other people smile or they're they better because they've encountered you, then I believe you're living on purpose. Mm -hmm. And I believe in my faith, I believe that when I meet my creator, I feel like, you know, I'm going to be judged based on, you know, did you use your gifts? Did you make the world a better place because you've existed? And are yeah. people better because they've met you? Mm -hmm. And for me, every single day, that's why I try to be as as joyful as possible and as impactful as possible. So that's why... I love putting a smile on other people's face. And you know what? When you do help people, I feel like it's my purpose because mm -hmm. it makes me feel so damn freaking good. Right. You know, just little things, right? Like on my birthday, every day, my birthday is December 1st. I remember. It's yeah. freaking cold on December 1st. Yep. I go feed the homeless on my birthday, you know? And that to me, it's like, you know, do you do it for the shows and the likes on Instagram? No, I do it before because it makes me feel good. It feeds my heart. Mm -hmm. It feeds my heart. Yeah. And that's why I do it. And, and, and that's why I live the life I live is I'm very grateful. You know, much is given, much is required in this world. And a lot of people don't understand that. If you want to do something big, you're going to have to do something big. Nothing's just going to happen to you. You have to create it. But if you can live a life of make more, save more and give more, if you could live based on that mantra, I think you could live a pretty freaking good life. And mm -hmm. you don't have to make a million dollars to live an on purpose life. Yeah. It has nothing to do with how much money you make. It's it's what you do with the dollar that comes in and the impact that you make. It is it using your gifts. If you're the person that's making fifty thousand that could make five hundred thousand, but you choose not to, you're not living on your purpose because you're not using the gifts that were given to you. So you're quite selfish, mm -hmm. actually. If you're only making enough money to pay your bills, and that's it, and breathe air. 
But it's the person who making 50,000 who says, you know what, I just want to live in the hills, feed the squirrels, and I'm the happiest guy in the world, and I'll just try to help everybody based on the income I have. And that's my dream. Mm -hmm. Then that now that person's living on purpose. So living on purpose means using the gifts and the abilities that you have. That's what I believe. So Makes sense. I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Definitely. Very much appreciated. Where do you see yourself in, uh, let's say, the next 10 years? Do you... Uh... Think you're going to be doing exactly what you're doing today, or I see myself with more hair. More hair? Yeah. More hair? Yeah, of course. I'm gonna, I, I got to get a little bit on top. I think. You know, I'll donate some. I got, as, I got plenty to share. You shit. got, you got a lot of hair, yeah. man. You got a lot of hair. How's your hair? You got a lot of hair? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's yeah, turning right? gray now. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, I, you know, in ten years, I really do see myself like, you know, the the question I always ask myself as we, you know, build a business and, mm -hmm. and make more money is when is enough is enough yeah you know if you have one card you need two cars you have two cars you need four cars if you need four cars you need six. when is enough is enough mm -hmm. and so you know you have a big house you need a bigger house and you have that house you need a bigger house for what yeah so for me i'm not chasing materialism mm -hmm. you know my next 10 years is living on purpose meaning how many people am I helping to become successful yeah. is an indication of me using my gifts. If I climb a mountain and 30 people are climbing the mountain with me, if I get to the top in 10 years from now and I'm the only one, I am a horrible human being. Yeah. So for me, it's not about how much money I can make in the next 10 years. It's how impactful I can make other people's lives in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So my indication of success is no longer about the cars I drive and the houses I purchase and all that stuff. It's more so if I were not to be here in 10 years from now, would people on my eulogy say, Daniel helped me because of this, 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 and that. And if I made other people's lives much more easier, if I inspired people, People have a better lifestyle because I gave them the opportunity or I mentored them or I encouraged them or people feel better mentally because they came to my leadership seminars or something like that. That to me is living on purpose. Mm -hmm. Are there things that you want to do? Of course. Like, have I ever been to a, an African safari? No. But that's going to be a part of it. Now, it's not the African safari that I want to go to. It's me going to a, a village in Africa and building a soccer little facility where I'm gonna bring soccer balls and I'm gonna feed the village. And that's what I wanna do. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of stuff to me is worth more than somebody giving me a million dollars. I gotta be honest with you. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So to me, I get emotional when I think about it because you know, my mom died two years ago. And um, my mom was like my, my hero. She was the most mm -hmm. sweetest, most kindest person ever in my life. And I think maybe where I found the love and the heart was from my mom. Mm -hmm. So my mom got Alzheimer's like a long time ago and she battled it and it's a nasty disease. Like I don't have, yeah. I don't have enemies, but I wouldn't even want my enemy to have mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. That's it's how horrible. bad it is. It's a horrible yeah. disease, man. And, and a lot of people live with that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I remember my mom going through that and I've been there all day, every day and seeing her pain. But I think that for me, life was being there in the moment that I was able to be there. Whereas I think if I didn't push myself earlier on in my years, yeah. I don't know if I would be in the financial position that I could just take time off and do whatever I want to do and be wherever I want to be. And, mm -hmm. and when people needed me, I could be there. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are strapped where they can't just take off a week off work or two weeks off work. And if they do, their That's job right. may be, suspended possibly i don't yeah. know some shit like that right mm -hmm. so for me to be there i think it was great and and the feeling that i have right now about my mom and thinking about how my heart is sad mm -hmm. thinking about my mom i never want that feeling to go away mm -hmm. i want to still feel the love that i have for my mom that to me means that that's how much she means for me and she taught me how to be a good human being you know she taught me how to you know how to love other people and you don't know what people are going through. Sometimes people show a facade on the outside, yeah. but internally they're really struggling. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to reach out to people, um, check in on them, but don't just give the same old, hey, how you doing? Yeah. How you really doing? Hey, I'm yeah. calling you just to see how you are doing. I'm, mm -hmm. I just, I haven't talked to you in a while. I'm concerned. 
you know, I love you. I'm there for you. Like, I think that that human connection, that human touch is really what we're missing in this world more Mm -hmm. today than ever before. And I think that as human beings, if we could, we can indoctrinate more love in the world, we would actually have little to no racism, little to no of many different problems that we have out there. Mm -hmm. Because you know, we're all different races, cultures, religions, yep. but why do we get along? Because we all love each other. Mm-hmm. Love is the one thing that carries, you know, the most weight in this world. And my mom was, I was very fortunate to be grown up from the best mom ever. Mm-hmm. And she, she instilled that with me. So every single day when I live life, I'm living life on purpose because in the next two years, if I could live through vicariously from my mom's vision of being a good human being, making an impact in the world, then it doesn't matter how much money I make. You can take it all away. I'll be able to make it out because it's who I am as a human being, which makes me successful, not the money. Mm -hmm. It's how I think. It's how I work. It's how I believe in myself. Money is not a byproduct of your success. It's who you are makes you successful. And for me, um, living on purpose is the most important thing in making a difference in other people's lives. So, you know, all the toys and the trinkets are good, yeah. but let's just be honest. You, you know, what did Denzel Washington say? You're never going to see a U, you know, you're going to see a, a U-Haul being pulled by a hearse. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not carrying your shit with you when you die. That's right. Yeah. So at the end of the day, when you're dead, other people are going to be driving my car, living in my home, doing all that stuff. So I want to make a difference in other people's lives. I really, really do want to make a difference in people's mm-hmm. lives. So that's my next year, 10 years is, you know, it's not about doubling my income. It's doubling yeah. the success of the people in my organization. You know, that's great. Makes yeah. sense. I thank God for your mom. Mm-hmm. I feel blessed. I feel like I've learned so much just in this little hour, but yeah. I've been touched <laughs> by you in your life already. Thank Absolutely. you, brother. Thank you, man. So, um, yeah, a lot of amazing stories, uh, amazing human being who's uh, been everywhere, done so many things and uh, made such a positive impact on so many people's lives. So thank you for uh, coming out tonight and being on the show. It's been a blast. Um, Just kind of reminiscing old times, you know, telling us the stories of the last uh, few years that you've been on with your son and going to Qatar and all these crazy ass places. Um, But uh, yeah, I think that's where we're going to end it off for tonight. Uh, Thanks to everybody here. Here. Again, Daniel, thanks for coming out. Our uh, co host Mo. And uh, smash the like button, subscribe if you're new, turn those post notifications on, and uh, we will see you guys in the next episode. Thank you. Bye.